morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Dear, uh, dear conference guests, colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you all at BA School of Business and Finance for the 15th Annual Scientific Baltic Business Management Conference, Business and Finance, Multi-Perspectives of the Digital Age. Theodore Roosevelt, the 26th President of the United States, once said that nine-tenths of wisdom consists in being wise in time. This expression are of very famous men I'd like to rela relate also to our conference. The theme of the conference and keywords digital transformation and green transformation are very topical and extremely re relevant today. Paradigm shift related to digital age in business and in whole society comes with new opportunities, new ways of driving businesses, new attitudes, but also with new challenges and risks as well. This creates not only new innovative technological solutions, but also affects the staff competencies, relationships, and internal environment of the companies. It requires new theoretical uh, insights and new management culture. A dialogue on climate neutral economics, the green course of na at national and transnational cooperation and green transformation at the company level play a unique role in this process, especially for, for finance institutions. Our past years of experience prove that this conference serves a great platform, a kind of meeting place for faculty, researchers, and business people. I believe that new ideas voiced during this conference will find implementation through new knowledge, new research projects, doctoral thesis, and further partnerships. This annual conference has been arranged jointly with our partners Risab University and Stockholm School of Economics and Riga, and I'd like to thank my colleagues for their cooperation over many years. In particular, I'd like to expand my gratitude to guests and plenary speakers who kindly agreed to participate in our conference in live as well as online. I wish all participants in, and the audience of the conference an interesting, rich in insights and enjoyable conference days. Good luck. Thank you. And uh, now I would like to give floor to my colleagues, Irin Seniko, Rector of Risab University, and after that, Anders Palzo, Rector of Stockholm School of Economics in Riga. Good morning. Good morning, dear conference participants, dear guests, fellow researchers, dear students. Reseba is glad to be part of the joint venture because nowadays it's not only about the competition and on one hand we compete with uh, BA School of Business and Finance, Tohol School of Economics, many other education players, but we also collaborate. And it is also the feature of a modern economy. Digital transformation has become a buzzword nowadays. And even looking at the auditorium, we see here, as now say, digital visitors and digital natives. But regardless whether we are visitors or we're natives, we all have to lead our companies through digi digital transformation. We have to make sure that our companies stay competitive in uh, the digital age. And the purpose of this year's conference is really to give a research base to this issue, issues to discuss it together and also probably get new ideas. As any conference brings new ideas, I also would like to wish you get lots of new ideas as a result of three-day conference. In fact, also talking about the any, uh, success of any conference, there are three things which made the conference success. And there is the rule of th three things. Three things is that, that as a result of any of the conference, you have to get three new ideas, you have to get three new friends, and you have to get three kilos because of good food. So I wish you so that you get all three as a result of this conference. Enjoy these days and let lots of new ideas uh, emerge as a result. Thank you very much.
Yeah, good morning everyone. Apparently there is a magic number of three and I'm the third person to welcome you here. So I think a lot of things have been said, but uh, first of all, I would like to say a very big thank you to our colleagues and friends at Banco Aug School, also Receba, for organizing the conference. And the two conference topics, the two highlights I see, the number of highlights, but I really want to highlight what we will discuss this morning on uh, green finance, green bonds, and then the digital, digital transformation, because these are challenges that we as educators, researchers are working on, how to address it. And I think it's quite interesting also in the light of the history of research in economics and business that here we have problems identified by scientists, be it in natural sciences, be it in IT, and where we as business researchers, researchers in economics, can really make a contribution to, to make it easier to do this transformation, be it an environmental one through green bonds, green finance, or be it the digital transformation. In this context, since I know that everything research education, they are always very long processes. So I know that when I retire, most of the issues we will discuss here today might not yet be solved. And that's why it's very encouraging to see so many of if I may call you the young generation here today, to be inspired to make the network and also to gain the three kilos we heard here. So I'm very happy to see you here. I'm very happy that we have the conference and I wish you a successful event. Thank you very much and have a good conference. <laughs> and now to the moderator, I think, please. It's here. <laughs> it's here. <laughs> I have my own mic, oh, so yeah, I, will, yeah, yeah. I will feel very flexible here. So uh, happy to see really a lot of people here, especially the young students and uh, those who are also watching us in the live stream. I'm a graduate of BA School of Business and Finance here and at the moment working as like innovation manager in uh, SEB Bank. And uh, as representing the finance sector, I think that this is really interesting topic at all, like to see what will happen in the upcoming like 30 years and, and by seeing and reading uh, European uh, Green Deal documentation and communication messages it's said that actually till 2050 there'll be quite a lot of time and it takes uh, uh, around like 25 years to change some kind of a value chain of one specific industry but the next five years are very critical in order to start those changes so I, I, I see those change makers here and thanks to the state representatives and also academic sector that they are here and initiating this discussion. I will be the one who will uh, guide you through the day as well. So we'll have uh, two sessions. So we'll have like a green transformation plenary discussion and also digital transformation uh, session as well. And to come back maybe to the basics as well. So I would say that the green deal at the global lev level, and especially in the European Union, has the important place in the, in the dialogue between all those industries and the partner partners. And uh, it's also equally crucial for these like, digital issues as well. So, and currently in both areas, so there has been like a clear link that is like closed with like financial sector. We should understand our role in it. What's the mission of it? And as well, the challenges that might be around that. So as soon as we'll fix them and we'll start to work on them, I think that it's very uh, important that we move on. So, and uh, that's why this like thematic focus on these uh, upcoming discussions and uh, presentations is uh, in two as aspects. So how to adapt the performances of industries and as well transforming, transforming them into according to this like green and digital transformation scenarios. And uh, knowing that uh, quite a lot of funds will be involved into this uh, process in general and uh, as I mentioned that uh, it takes some time and really big mobilization will be needed among different partners into this journey. Um, we will have to save as well some fuel on the road and we also have to uh, maybe save and to, to think about the digital solutions. That's why we will start with presentations which are happening remotely. So when we'll have like a first part of plenary session regarding green transformation, where by having three presentations and the first one will come from a remote, remote channel 
And uh, I would love to welcome Dr. Gregor Volturius, PhD, Research Fellow, Head of Operations and Engagement from Stockholm Sustainable Finance Center, Stockholm Environment Institute, to share his reflections on EU Sustainable Finance Action Plan and the Green Deal. So, welcome on the screen. Um, I would like to kick off my presentation with a short, like our views on the two key pillars uh, of green finance we see in Europe, which is the Youth System Finance Action Plan and the New Deal. I will just start the presentation uh, and then I think we have some time for questions. Okay, so I will first have to share my screen, I just realized, sorry about that. So uh, I've already been introduced, I will jump over that, as, as, as we mentioned, I work at the Stockholm Environment Institute, as well as the Stockholm Sustainable Finance Center. Um, and what we do is, we, we were founded by uh, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the Ministry of Energy and Environment in 2017, by the Swedish government. Uh, after there was realization within the Swedish government that there is a strong need to combine sustainability expertise by the bypass, the system of the sustainable uh, the environment institute, and a strong uh, economics component or expertise, which is provided by the Stockholm School of Economics. And both organizations work in the center collaboratively. Uh, which sometimes works really well, and of course, sometimes also encounters some difficulties. What we do is we work on four main pillars. So we work in education and training. So we have a quite extensive objective education program. We have capacity building uh, built in, into the center. Um, we have online training modules and something like this, where we reach out to academics and policymakers. We do research. Tell you a little bit more about this in a second. Uh, we have direct engagement with the financial sector, both policy as well as uh, financial institutions. We collaborate on developing yeah, solutions, mainstream sustainability into the financial market. And we also work on innovation, uh, fintech innovation, particularly to enhance um, transparency and both sustainable investments. So what we have done in the last little over two years, uh, really, is that we have worked with the IFC, which is part of the World Bank, on the Green Balance Program, uh, inviting developing country participants to Stockholm to learn more about how they can issue green bonds. We work uh, together with a, with a uh, private company to deliver system of finance courses for executives. Um, we work on research wise, we work on legal bonds, that's green bonds, sustainability bonds, uh, as well as certain economy bonds, uh, they exist. Um, we've done some work on long termism and active ownership, and we have a very strong component there on developing countries, including Africa. Um, we work uh, towards the EU, I'm personally also the EU uh, policy engagement officer, uh, to work together with the technical expert group. Uh, Developing the taxonomy, which we'll mention in a second, and we also work innovation wise with a number of efforts to really increase transparency. And that includes something like trace finance, which you see at the very uh, bottom of this slide, which is trying to link investment flows, private and public, towards sectors that are at risk of deforestation. 
such as commodity imports from South America. So now on to a little bit the substance of this talk. So as you may all know, there is something called the EU Action Plan to Finance Sustainable Growth, which was originally launched in March 2018 after a number of years of deliberations within the Commission, the Parliament, and the Council on how to really promote sustainable investments within the EU. This plan, as I will call it from now on, has three main objectives. It is trying to reorientate capital flows towards sustainable investments in order to achieve sustainable inclusive growth, and ultimately the two key targets, policy targets that we will set ourselves, which is of course the Paris Climate Agreement of global temperature increase well below 2 degrees with the aspiration of 1.5 degrees, and of course the sustainable development goals that we want to achieve by 2030. To achieve that first target, the first objective, we also need to manage financial risks stemming from climate change, risk to the future, and environment degradation and social issues. That's the second objective of the plan. And given that this plan is very much market-oriented, it achieves this through fostering transparency and long-term financial and economic activity. Very briefly on some of the actions that are part of this plan. There's 10 in total, and I only pick those that I will comment on. The first one, the first action, is probably the one that's been most talked about, and it really works as an underpinning for the entire action plan, which is developing a taxonomy of sustainable economic activities. And maybe some of you have already heard of this discussion that's been going. The plan also includes actions on developing standards and labels and ultimately benchmarks that can help investors understand the carbon footprint of their portfolio. And that also then helps to put up certain guardrails of how investments should be done to deliver on the objectives of the plan, and ultimately the climate agreement and the sustainable development goals. There's also a number of actions that have been less talked about, but probably have even fewer implications, and that's particularly action seven, which is clarifying institutional investors and asset managers' duties. That might actually come with some mandatory steps, eventually clarifying how financial advice should be given and how investments should be conducted. That also includes action eight, which is incorporating sustainability and prudential requirements, which of course is quite a significant step to take. And then overall, the same thing, sustainability disclosure and accounting rulemaking, which is action nine, which also has some potential legislative implications. And now I can just comment on some of these aspects of the action plan and its actions. So the taxonomy, as I already mentioned, is really the underpinning of this entire plan, as it is that it's been envisioned by the Commission. So in order for investments to be taxonomy eligible, they need to contribute significantly to one of the EU's six environmental objectives. Two of these objectives are climate mitigation and climate adaptation, but it also includes biodiversity protection, for example. Investments to be taxonomy eligible also should not do any significant harm to any other environmental objectives. The view here being is that if you are investing, for example, in a hydro dam in Sweden, for example, you should not have any adverse implications on biodiversity in Iceland, for example. The Commission is currently working on developing technical thresholds, eligible thresholds, for the first two of these objectives, so mitigation and adaptation. They will be published later this year, and work is being conducted on the four remaining environmental objectives. What is not really considered in the taxonomy as it's currently developed is how the EU 
finance in China will impact the much broader SDGs, and that is highlighted here on this slide. So we can expect that if the taxonomy is adopted, it will incentivize investments, but we don't know enough how they will overlap with SDGs, other SDGs that are not necessarily environmentally related, such as education, welfare, and synergies and trade-offs need to be addressed, and we need better policies to exploit these synergies and minimize trade-offs. Next, I would like to move to standards, benchmarks, and tables. So the EU plan includes certain standards and labels that they would have to develop to earmark certain funds and also help investors in the market to change and shift how they do investments. So there's a green one standard that's currently being developed, which will probably cover exclusively taxonomy line of activities. That builds on the already existing green ones market. And then we have the benchmark population, which has already changed. So we already have now a Paris-aligned benchmark, which includes companies that are whose emission profile is well aligned with achieving Paris already today. And then we have a transition-aligned benchmark, which is basically a progressive benchmark that includes companies that have to reduce their emissions by a certain amount every year to transition from where they are now towards 2050 and becoming carbon neutral. As I already mentioned, the green bonds market has grown quite significantly. I am personally an expert on in second opinion reviews and green bonds frameworks. I've done this for the last two or three years. So this is quite an exciting market. However, the problem with the green bonds market is that the impact reporting is extremely inconsistent. We're working currently on our research group on this. So it's a welcoming of course, we're welcoming that the works on harmonizing how the green bonds market is supposed to work and impact reporting is going to be conducted. On the benchmark side, I think we see a great potential to move away from static economic understanding of carbon credits of investments. What we mean here is that currently many investors, the benchmark companies against the 2050 target of carbon neutrality, and when most companies, of course, in the universe do not comply with carbon neutrality currently, so many of them divest. At least we've seen this with coal companies, we've seen this with some natural gas companies, and the problem with divest is that, at least in the scientific community, this is not considered a viable step to transition the entire economy to carbon neutrality. Rather, we see uh, examples of successful active ownership where investors pay attention to the scale again and apply a dynamic benchmark to tell companies as well, you know, we want you to achieve 7% decrease in carbon emissions for you to achieve 1.5 degrees um, in the future. This is a, quite an interesting thing, we will see how it plays out. And the last point I would like to make on the EU plan is sustainability and climate risk disclosure. So the EU plan does aim to reduce risk of financial short-term prison by uh, uh, highlighting sustainability and climate risk disclosure. Uh, it has already published on violent guidelines and how climate reporting should be included in the already existing non-financial reporting directive. And what we understand is that the Commission is considering to make some of this disclosure mandatory. Um, they highlighted in the box there, uh, just very quickly like before that, I would just mention that, the, uh, that some of that uh, risk disclosure is already being mandated by the pension funds in Sweden and in the UK, based on the work that the um, task force for climate um, related reporting is doing TCFD. So the general common standards of sustainability and climate risk disclosure will of course be key for incorporating sustainability in financial advice and therefore institutional asset managers' duties and overall reducing the risk of short-termism. But we need to really be honest with ourselves and understand that just disclosure in and of itself is insufficient to read our capital. We really have to consider um, regulatory steps to disincentivize 
less than zero fossil fuels. Now, just briefly on the Green New Deal, uh, which I've also mentioned, which is, of course, this new big flagship policy by the new incoming commission. A quick comment, comment there, we have to make it that it's quite extraordinary that the new commission is picking up environmental and climate policy as the first real package that they're launching uh, in within their honeymoon period of the first 15 days, which we find very encouraging. Uh, so the overall the Green New Deal, as you probably know, has the objective of achieving carbon neutrality on the continent by 2050. And in the order to achieve this, the Green New Deal lines out a number of actions and, and policy changes this whole next year or two. And I just listed here some of the things that are currently ongoing. And you can see that this is a really impressive, very comprehensive roadmap that they have set themselves. So we have a climate law, which will be announced on the 2nd of March. You have that for me. I have this one uh, in official sources, but you can bet on it. It's coming on the 2nd of March, so it's a little less than two weeks ago, that to go. We have a revision of the 2030 emission reduction targets coming before the summer. We have an industry strategy for the economy action plan. Those two things will be launched on the 10th of March. And there will be a number of sector-specific strategies on offshore wind, batteries, on agriculture, and the Commission also very eager to review national energy and climate plans, which the EU member states had to submit by end last year, and only two countries did it. What's in the Green New Deal that touches on sustainable finance? The key uh, thing here to be aware of is the European Green Deal Investment Plan which aims to mobilize to one trillion over the decade. And you can Google it and find out how they're gonna patch it up with the same funds and additional funds. Additional funds are really only 7.5 billion euros uh, that have been you know, made uh, available additionally to what's already been planned. So it is much more a redirecting existing funds than creating new funds, really creating new money. Part of that deal would be a just transition mechanism, which has been much talked about, that it needs to be in Europe, because it's really supposed to help um, fossil fuel dependent um, regions to transition into carbon neutrality. And it's really the most contested part so far of the Green New Deal, with its ultimate renewable money. And then we have a renewable, uh, uh, a renewable energy finance strategy, will come out in this fall, and review of state guidelines. This is quite interesting part because it is touching on the, the fact that we still have around 2.3 trillion dollars every year in subsidies for fossil fuels globally, which is exceeding the level of subsidies that's given to renewable energy. I just would like to highlight that. And then just to round up here, um, what we would like to see actually is uh, that we focusing the role of central banks in financing the Green Deal. So central banks, as you know, are on top of financial parity, and they have been really called up the Green Deal to, uh, to support it. Uh, Ms. Lagarde, the new head of the ECB, when she was confirmed um, in the parliament, got quite a lot of questions on what she would like to do to, to finance uh, the transition to carbon neutrality. And she's been a little bit, she's, I think, personally quite interested in this, but what the bank and what the politicians are to do is a different question altogether. The proposals that you know one could make is that central banks should integrate climate risks in civility monitoring and changing capital requirements in asset purchasing programs, particularly in green bonds, or changing macroprudential policy and credit guidance. The message here is that you know central banks have actively promoted industrial revolutions in the past. They've been a very active actor in policy making. And this should be considered when we think of the Green Deal, and of course, this will require a change of mandate. Uh, the other action that the banks would take already now is to revisit their actions on the sovereign debt market. The Swedish bank, the Swedish Central Bank, at the beginning of this year, it's quite remarkable, they sold off uh, sovereign debt from two Australian provinces due to their lack of climate action. That is a kind, of a, a, a kind of a rapid step to starve fossil fuels of debt finance. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Dr. Gregor Volturius. So uh, we can afford like to have like one, two questions now to Gregor, even uh, despite the fact that he can hear us maybe after like five seconds while, while I'm talking here. So if you would have so many questions uh, at the moment, we could ask and get an answer from the doctor. Uh, otherwise, I would say that we will give him floor as well after the discussion, so to give his like impressions and reflections of how that was like our discussion and what were the topics we covered based on the research that he has done on this like uh, action plan. Any question in the audience? Five, four, three, two, one, last chance. If not, then uh, I was really interested to see is there, is there already in the uh, world like some proactive steps where we are like moving forwards to this like green transformation and um, we, we took a look on the Latvian national like uh, level as well and it appeared that there are some already active players who are like putting some steps uh, towards that direction and we have a case yeah, and uh, that's why I would love to in invite uh, Mr. Srenis Berzinch, the chairman of the management board of joint stock company uh, development financed institu institution Altum, to share the case study of Altum regarding the green bonds. Welcome. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Srenis Berzinch. Uh, obviously, Bank University is my alma mater, so I'm always uh, come back. So, Mr. Sarnovich, Mr. Natrinch, thank you very much for always also inviting also Altum on those cases where there could be some overlap of interest about which you would like to hear sometimes in your conferences and uh, about those experiences we can share. This time, we are invited to share our experience on very particular issue about green bonds, and there are a lot of talks also about green finances, green bonds, also in Latvia, as you correctly mentioned, but unfortunately only few examples of that, and Altum is uh, one of those companies, and we can actually provide uh, our experience and show what benefit it is uh, for the society, for uh, all those green actions, as well as to show what uh, type of finances we attracted, what was the process, so I guess this will be my main task for today. So where did actually the idea come from? Uh, the, the thing was that uh, Altum basically is a state-owned company. We have 40% uh, owned by the Ministry of Finance, 30% are owned either by Ministry of Economy or Ministry of Agriculture, so fully 100% are owned by the state. What we do, we provide with uh, the state support in those fields where there is a market gap where there is a lack of finance. We don't provide normally grants, only in few cases, but usually we provide financial instruments, guarantees, loans, also venture capital, and we are more than 20, uh, we have more than 20 active uh, programs currently. The problem was that for one particular very good initiative to give a very good uh, support for uh, green uh, ideas for SMEs, we didn't have resources because the funds were somehow divided already before that. Uh, a lot of money went for another uh, program which was uh, dealing with energy efficiency, but it was more for residentials. You know that there's a lot of houses in Latvia, the flats, God bless, which are still uh, not very uh, energy efficient. So we have a program where we support those uh, old houses uh, to create them uh, more energy efficient. But this program is not targeted for SMEs, so we had a great idea from our program designers to uh, have a program which is dedicated for SMEs. For example, if you are a company owner and you have a very good idea how to uh, create something in your company to be more efficient, you could get a loan. Obviously, you could also get this loan in the banks, but what we saw that sometimes there is also a lack of um, finances in those cases when there is actually nothing more like uh, cash flow which already has this energy efficient events taken and we could use uh, uh, this cash flow as a collateral and this is basically quite aggressive type of loan but for, for that we need to have finance. So what we did, we started to figure it out that we could be the first who will uh, have firstly this program, very green program, very uh, dedicated to, for SMEs, for all those good things also the previous uh, lecture gave. 
uh, this, uh, this concept about green bond and where, where it should go, as well as we could be the first state institution who could uh, give, a, uh, who could attract finances to then later on give them as a uh, state support, right? The one uh, company which before Altum uh, issued green bonds was Latvenergo. Everyone knows Latvenergo. Then there was a gap, I guess, for uh, five years. Nobody did that uh, once again. Now you perhaps heard last year also Air Baltic issued the bonds. But before that, Altum was the second one. And for the state support, I guess, we were the first one who did that. So if we are talking about those benefits, what uh, any institution could uh, gain from uh, this, this, this procedure, what we call issue of uh, green bonds, I guess those are several. Uh, if we turn, for example, to the fixed rate or uh, also longer repayment shadow, efficient money, all those things which are very important for the company who deals with the, uh, uh, who deals with the state support and also attracting financing from elsewhere, we see that, um, uh, okay, currently there is a situation when there is no, no big eurobond, right? It's basically negative and so on. But I guess everyone here understands that it's not a normal situation, right? Before a couple of years, we used to have a situation when there is a high uh, eurobond and so on. So when you are planning your finances, particularly in long term, it's very good that you know what uh, particular amount of the money, what will be the coupon, for example, in the case of bonds, which you will pay, right? So fixed rate without different uh, those things which might change is very good for us to have uh, plans uh, in the near future. Efficient money, what I meant here. Efficient money means that, for example, when we take loans, in a bigger amount we are taking loans, and then we are taking also actions to, 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 to launch those, this, this, uh, this money in particular fields where there is an absence of finance, uh, we see that uh, in those places where we also attract money, for example, international financial institutions or state treasury, we are very often uh, asked to have like kind of collateral, right? We need to uh, give our collateral, for example, our uh, loan portfolio or some other things from our assets. I guess it's uh, everyone here is uh, somehow connected with finances, so you know what I mean. In this case, when you are issuing the bonds, you don't need to have collateral uh, when you are issuing a bond, giving a collateral, right? Investor comes to your uh, company, he sees the situation, there might be some situation uh, when you have like deeper questions about that, but if you convince them that you are very uh, safe, that you are prudent partner, then you can uh, attract the finances without uh, having uh, uh, possibility or need to give collateral. As, uh, as well as longer, uh, also longer money, I would like to say so. Basically, it was also up to us what to do, uh, what would be our uh, aim, how long uh, we, uh, this money could be, right? It was up to us. We could also issue bonds which were like 12 or 15 years and so on. In our case, the first issue, and I, I will show you how it went, we, we choose uh, seven years for, uh, for one particular program, and I guess that was also in order to uh, attract uh, lower uh, coupon, lower yield. Those are things which are connected with finances, but there are more things which we are also glad when we are issuing the bonds, what we see, what we need to do. Not only think about those finances, but also about other things. If we are talking about a well-regulated financial process, then we should uh, remember that it's also a prospect with which we need to prepare. Prospect where we also need to uh, show for investors uh, all main things about Altum as transparent as it possible. I guess it goes very uh, good together with corporate governance because in order to do that, to show that we have the highest standards, what we did, we attracted Moody's. Everyone, I guess, also here in this audience knows Moody's. There is S&P, there is uh, Fitch, but there is also Moody's. Uh, so we obviously choose Moody's as one of the best uh, credit rating agency in the world, in our opinion. Uh, we attracted uh, this company um, and uh, what we did, we also get BAA1 credit rating, which is the highest in Latvia. Uh, and uh, we are actually all um, uh, just one level below Latvia's rating according to Moody's, it's A3, at least on that time it was A3. External and internal PR, I guess this could be last but not least, of course, if you are doing all those things in right order, if you succeed with that, there will be a great also PR for you uh, to have, not spending a lot of money, right? A lot of conferences, 
you will be mentioned as a good example in a lot of audience, audiences, uh, be very frankly. Also, uh, mass media will take uh, attention because, as it was also correctly mentioned uh, before, there is no uh, such a thing like a lot of companies who are issuing the green bonds. As I said, it's more like talks about that, but not so uh, much examples. So what is the process? This is our case. You can see uh, this timetable, I guess not so long, and it, uh, I should mention that it's for the first issue, right? Because you will see also how fast we did the second issue of the bonds, but at the beginning we got acceptance from the shareholder. It happened at the very beginning of the year when we also approved our budget for the uh, 2017. We also uh, informed that we would like to issue bonds. We explained why we would do that. We showed the program. Um, uh, our idea of the program, which was also generated during the year uh, 2017. And you, also, uh, you can also see also those other steps, like for example, we attracted SAB like a uh, lead arranger, basically our main partner during this, uh, all this trip. Uh, SAB was, and we are very, it's kind of advertisement, but we were very satisfied with what they did uh, by uh, letting us also uh, to have very good this first process of uh, issuing the bonds. Then we had on March first negotiation with Moody's and already after a couple of months we got the Moody's rating and we were very, very glad that it was so high. And of course it was e easier uh, said than done. There was a lot of internal things we need to uh, make in right order, but we succeed and when we got this BAA1 actually already then uh, we would like to, 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 to drink some champagne, but we did not. We waited till October, but we already then got a uh, feeling that everyone, everything will be quite good in October because it was a real good uh, example that if uh, you have a credit rating agency which gives you such a high rating that this first issue also will be good. Then afterwards, it's Financial Capital Markets Commission, FCMC, which approved the prospectus. It happened in August, and we also get this green bond certificate, which approved that our program, uh, which uh, will be dedicated for launching this money, which we will attract, it is with the green bond standard, and uh, it also was a, a great thing for us. And then on October, it was like uh, first issue, and it ran quite good. We will see uh, after a couple of slides uh, more about that. Okay. Here you can see the, the program, the green bond uh, framework. Obviously, it's more like pictures, but uh, for example, uh, last week in credit committee, we approved the case when there will be support of a uh, great uh, part of electro uh, autos right here. And we also uh, have heard a lot of about those things, right? But not so mi uh, many projects are supported. So there will be uh, a possibility up to 100 uh, autos for that company, it's a big, a ba basically quite a major loan for us. Uh, but there is also smaller uh, things what we are supporting. For example, you see a lightning, like switching from the usual lightning to uh, LED lightning, right? It's, I guess, it's a very, very famous thing, which everyone knows that. We also support that. Then we can also found some, uh, find some more trivial examples. We also support SMEs. For example, if you have a small restaurant and they have an oven, if we see that we can uh, change this oven in order to have a more energy-efficient oven and they will spare money in upcoming three or five years, we can give a loan for this changing of oven actually without collateral. If we see that there will be uh, some expenditures which will be saved from this uh, cash flow in the, in the uh, future, right? So this, those are uh, just a couple of examples and I guess everyone understands the concept uh, how uh, this program could work. We also support, as I said, uh, and several of those projects could be also quite small in amount of several tens of thousands of euros or 100,000 of euros, but we have also several loans which in amount of several, uh, one or several million euros in this program, uh, which we are very proud. By the way, there are also a lot of talks by supporting ESCO's company, also those operators who go uh, in other companies, uh, make them more energy efficient, but they are not able to attract a lot of finances for themselves, so also they uh, have possibility to use our program. So this is the thing uh, which we are always showing and uh, saying those are real examples what uh, can happen with your
company. But back to finances, back to what we did in, in order, perhaps you might have a question, what was the coupon, what, how big was the interest, here you have this situation uh, in a very simple way, right? Uh, when we got also the rating, we had this feeling that it will be quite good thing. What we, uh, uh, what, what we also have to say, went to the market and we said that we would like to have like the first issue could be like a pilot project and we, could, uh, we would be happy if we could uh, attract finances uh, about 20 million euros. The interest w was almost seven times more, right? It was in almost 140 million euros when investors saw our, uh, uh, our situation, uh, when they saw our uh, roadshow. Uh, and you can see that actually a uh, roadshow took place only in three countries. Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia. This is it. It was quite simple. You could do that in two days, right? Uh, so it's quite uh, simple to do. Of course, you can go to Warsaw or Helsinki or London. But uh, for this, for this pilot project, we didn't uh, need that. We, we, uh, we got the feeling that it will be quite good interest, seven times more. And we attracted 24, 000, uh, 24 investors from Baltics, from uh, Germany, from Sweden, also like uh, big... Uh, asset managers, uh, also some pension plans, insurance company, uh, <coughs> etc. We always say don't be afraid of investors. I guess we don't should be afraid of them, right? They are normal things. Of course, what you will see actually it's a typical typical situation with the roadshow. It might uh, sound so strange or what will happen, the questions of investors. Um, I guess the situation is quite normal. There is a table there is some 10 or 50 guys who like like asking very very direct questions don't <laughs> in any case don't try to lie or something like that if you don't know the answer better say that you will be more precise but don't ever ever start to float without a uh, real understanding of what you are doing always be strict give very transparent uh, answers because those guys of course are professionals uh, most of them have like also they wallets with their uh, managing in amount of billions right so if you will be uh, if you will do everything in accordance with good corporate governance everything will be good so in our case it was very interesting several hours with uh, I would like to say so partners already now and um, we are always enjoying this process by the way this year we will issue bonds for the first time already and we are looking forward that it will be also a success story Second issue, just the one slide, it was more I, saw, uh, I showed you all those tables about time frame, things you have to do, those benefits and so on. And obviously for the first time it took longer because we were very preparing very much in order to have the first issue of the bonds like a success story. The second thing we compare it with the walking with the park. Okay, 16 hours perhaps very long walking, but it was really, uh, if we are also calculating uh, our time which we are spending for different things, because it's also an expenditure, we just counted it something like 16 hours and it was again a very good process and it was uh, very, um, very easy to, d uh, to do for the second time. Here you can see the teamwork, um, also, those, uh, those, uh, also uh, those partners we have, okay, something happened with the slides, but here you can see, uh, uh, of course, obviously, you need also a good lawyer company. In our case, it was a company called Cobalt. Uh, there is a great uh, cooperation also currently between us and uh, Stock Exchange in uh, Latvia. Uh, everyone, I guess, uh, knows Daiga. Uh, then uh, Kaspers, uh, head of state treasury, some of Altum uh, employees, and also uh, this guy is from SEB as well as, uh, last but not least, uh, Mr. Lee Kljavin, who is the uh, Deputy State Secretary, Ministry of Finance, one of our uh, member of council, right? So this was also, as I said, like a kind of uh, uh, team job and uh, quite good cooperation with other institutions. So here you can see uh, some of those main actors. And I guess the last slide, uh, this, is, uh, we, uh, this is the thing we also like to show. This is, uh, I have only few pictures in my office. This is one of those pictures because this is uh, Times Square, New York, when, it, when we also had the situation, when we were the, uh, the second state-owned company who did it. It's a great su uh, success. It was also very good memories. Of course, when you issue the bonds for the first time, it's not the, that's the same feeling. 
but uh, this first issue of bonds, it was really uh, quite of a journey for us. I guess uh, summarizing up and uh, getting the bridge to the current situation, I could just say several points about this issue. Uh, we see that this program running quite excellent. Uh, this is the first thing, a lot of uh, uh, which we showed uh, the bis this green uh, green bond program for energy efficiency, a lot of project support. This is the first thing. Uh, the second thing is that, as I mentioned already, we are not um, having the situation just once uh, with the green bond issue, but we already have issued bonds for the three times, and this year it will be the third time. By the way, during those years, our coupon also have decreased from 1.3 to 0 0.95. Those who are uh, studying the finances understand that it's uh, quite achievement. Third thing, we still have Moody's rating during those years, not only one for one particular year, but it um, also helps us to be good in shape because we cannot lose that. We always have to follow also our corporate governance issue and so on. Uh, the third thing is that we also are uh, getting stronger about our relationship with inter international financial institutions. Why? Because they know that we can attract money not only by taking loans from them, but we can also go to the uh, market, right, to the capital market. So we are more also secure to, to have this uh, fight about interest rates, being very frank, right? And the fifth, uh, I guess, uh, last but not least, currently for this year, for Altum, um, if we are looking what is the proportion, how we are uh, financing our project, for example, EU funds and state money from one side, and then uh, bonds and uh, loans from state in, uh, from international financial institutions. It's 49 percent, almost 50 percent, which Altum grants or launch for the particular projects. The money coming from bonds and international financial institutions. Why I'm saying this? In the current age, when we have the situation about Brexit, we have a lot of those uh, talks about there might be also. A uh, lower portion from EU money coming inside the Latvia, and one objective more thing is that we are getting our uh, uh, economic environment in better shape. So obviously, we uh, we will be uh, obviously we are moving forward to the situation we, when we are receiving less. We are we feel more safe that we can operate without those things. Of course, anytime we will have a program with the EU funds, we will use that money. But in normal way, we can operate, uh, we can uh, self-finance our projects. And this is one of the things which also development institutions elsewhere, good uh, institutions have the situation elsewhere. So this was a great project for us. So um, thank you for this at uh, paying attention for those couple of slides. If there are any questions, and, um, and I will be very pleased to answer them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Renis Vezinc. Exciting experience, and I think that we're going to dig deeper during the discussion. So how, especially this part where how do you feel as like being a flagship, like owner for this like a journey in a locally here in a national level. So it feels good. Th yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And then uh, the third presentation uh, that you will s see here will be more about understanding how this green deal uh, is related to the finance industry. So what's in it for the finance industry? And I'm welcoming uh, Mr. Martin Zemitis, PhD candidate, economic advisor, and European Commission representative in Latvia. It's a topic, European Green Deal. What's in it for the finance industry? Warm applause, Martin. Ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, welcome uh, to this uh, great conference. Thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting uh, the European Commission in uh, person, uh, Rector Sarnovic, uh, Rector Senikova, uh, dear uh, friend, Rector uh, Anders Palzov. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and contribute to this important scientific conference put up by the, by the Banking uh, University of Latvia. Um, today I will uh, talk literally on the European Green Deal and what's in it for you are already in the finance industry or who will be in the finance industry, but also more generally for those who will be related to the finance industry because the banks, the, the pension funds, the, the whole industry is the way the money moves through the economy. My good friend uh, Agnes Sibe, professor uh, of uh, Paris Business School, um, has a theory about change and transformation. And basically he says it takes 271 days for adult persons to change their habits. In Oslo, for instance, 
not going to gym to uh, going to gym uh, every other day, which is, by the way, good for you. Why I'm bringing up this uh, example of change, uh, personal change, change in your business, your firm, your industry, it is because without a fundamental change of habit, a change of behavior, uh, we will not achieve the European Green Deal. The European Green Deal is a very, very ambitious transformation. It's a wholesale transformation of the way our economy runs. We want to take out carbon of the economy. And taking out carbon by 2050 and making the economy carbon neutral doesn't require an evolution. It requires a revolution. It requires a wholesale change of the way we do things. And this relates not only to you know, the way the finance industry labels green products or how we issue green bonds and, or start issuing green bonds here, but it relates to the way we think about the economy and resource efficiency. So I will talk about what the European Green Deal really is and how that will touch the finance industry. The European Green Deal is our new growth strategy. It is the growth strategy for Europe. Europe has to compete with very agile and nimble uh, parts of the world. China, Japan, Korea, United States, the BRICS countries, we have a lot of competition. We have to have a growth strategy, okay? And therefore, I applaud this conference, which has both green and digital at the center of the transformation, because that's where Europe's strength is, green and digital. This uh, part of the session is related to green, so it is our new growth strategy. It's the growth strategy for Europe. It is the growth strategy for member states. It will help us cut emissions while creating jobs. And there's a lot of criticism. They say green is expensive. You know, we have to do a lot of investment. We have to put in 260 billion of fresh money for redirect investment from fossils to green, okay? That's a lot of money. A lot of traditional firms and traditional industries will not survive unless they transform themselves into green. How do we create jobs if industries are dying? Well, I argue that there's a green transition and green jobs waiting for us. And have we been able to do that before? The next slide I'll show. You know, we'll quickly go through this, but uh, we'll come back to it. Uh, is that these green graphs, you see, this is how we've been able to sort of um, uh, add value in the green industries. And this is the overall economic development. So you see that in the green industries, we have added more jobs and more growth than in traditional industries. This is the GDP, okay, the green graph. That's the GDP since 1990, the cut up here when we start sort of measuring these things. There's a big transformation in 1990, the Soviet Union imploded. You know, there was a big crisis in Scandinavia, a huge crisis in the Baltic states. GDP plummeted, but overall, the GDP has been growing while the greenhouse gas emissions have gone down. So we have, what we've done is we have decoupled emissions of CO2 and growth. And this has been possible in the past. So what we want to do is we want to continue this trend. We want to sort of uh, do this path dependently. We want to do the green growth while cutting emissions, and this is possible. It was already said that the Green Deal uh, is quite ambitious. Uh, it consists of a, a number of elements. It's a whole train transition. We want to transform the US economy for a green and sustainable future, but we do not want to leave anybody behind. There's lots of winners, but there's also lots of losers. In the EU, we have total market economy. We don't leave people, industries, firms behind. So we have to make this green transition a just transition. We help to help these regions, uh, which are very reliant on fossils. Coal in Poland, oil shale in Estonia, heat in Latvia. These are fossil industries. These are real jobs, real families, real people, real firms, and we need to help these regions. Poland has said that this ambition is too high. We cannot do it by 2050. We can do it by 2070. And the European Union is a union of solidarity. It's a family. It's a club. Okay? We don't lo leave anybody behind. So the first thing is, and Professor Volturi has already spoke about that, is to increase the EU's climate ambition. Okay? So from 1990, the base year, we wanted to decrease the CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions by 2020 by 20%. And we'll have, we will have achieved that. Europe will have cut the emissions by 20% compared to the 1990 by 2020. Okay? 2020 is this year, okay? So EU will have grown by 60% while cutting emissions by 23%, okay? 
So that's a great achievement. Not all countries have achieved it to that deeper degree. Different countries have started at different baselines, so that's for sure. But we're increasing this ambition. We're going to 40% by 2030, and uh, an ambition is even go to 50 or 55%, and we want to be perfectly climate neutral by 2050. What is climate neutral? Can somebody tell me what is climate neutral? Anybody? 200 people in the audience. Anybody? 100? Climate neutral. What's climate neutral? How are we climate neutral? What does that mean to you? So I need to tell you what is climate neutral, okay? So climate neutral is that we take the CO2 out of the atmosphere, or we don't emit CO2, uh, to the same degree. There's no fresh, you know, CO2 being coming into the atmosphere. You know that the trees you know, they, they eat CO2, right? And then the fossils, you know, they emit CO2. So climate neutral is that there is, you know, perfect neutrality between the new CO2 emitted and the CO2 that we uh, capture. There are new technologies of capturing, actually sucking the CO2 out of the air and putting that into the atmosphere. They are still expensive. They still don't really operate, but, uh, but that's, the, that's the ambition. So increasing the EU's climate ambition, setting the goals high, setting the vision high, okay? EU climate law. That's a very important contribution. Clean, affordable, secure energy. Energy that's produced from wind, from solar, from geothermal, pumps, using the, the natural energy that Earth has, you know, that the, the green sources, and moving away from coal, the most dirty energy, oil, gas, the transitional energy. Nuclear is, you know, is it renewable or is it not? The Brits would say it's, it's perfectly green. But what about the waste, you know? What about the waste that still has to be treated somehow? Mobilizing industry, you know, the, the, the production um, for a clean circular economy. We still produce things which we put to waste. Product design, designing products. You know, these uh, mobile phones that you're using here, you know, with the intent of recycling, take back schemes, right? We, most of us have seven or eight mobile phones at home we're no longer using. You know how many precious metals are there in these phones? They are laying to waste, right? We need to recycle, we need to redo, not sort of take, make, and throw out, do circular, circular economy, okay? Collaborative economy, drive together, you know? Not take our car and drop it off, car stands for 95% of the, the time idle. Uh, you know, these type of uh, economic activities. Building and renovation, about 40% of CO2 emissions, 30% of energy use, uh, our buildings and renovation systems. The EU says we'll put money where the mouth is. We need to double the renovation rate. We need to insulate. We need to make the buildings energy efficient, okay? We're producing heat and we're heating the planet and we're causing the, 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 the greenhouse gas effect. Building and renovating structures. Zero pollution ambition for a toxic free environment. Just think of the toxic fumes in many cities. In Riga is a good case in point. If you live in the center of Riga, Middle of summer, you leave the windows open and you have sort of a layer of dust, okay? That's a green city. Well, I don't think so. Preserving and restoring ecosystems and biodiversity without bees in two weeks, we have no food to eat, okay? Many places that's an issue from farm to fork so that the food that we eat is clean, toxic free, antibiotic free, friendly food system, and shift to sustainable smart mobility, the way we move ourselves, our goods, and everything else around, you know? Smart cities, systems which will help us to reduce CO2 in the car sector, okay? Electromobility, new technologies, hydrogen, you know? All of that needs a lot of investment. We need to finance the transition, and this is where you come in. This is where the finance industry, because with public money, with EU grants, with budgets alone, we will not be able to do this. We need to crowd in private investors. We need to put the uh, public money as a leverage, you know? as a multiplicator of the private money. And that's where the finance industries comes in, okay? So the emissions, I talked about that. So the, the Green Deal is more ambition, more ambition in Europe, the green uh, strategies, the growth strategies. And so the assessment is that you need anywhere between 175 to 290 billion of extra investment. That's a lot of money, okay? That's a lot of money. So how we will finance all of this, okay? So some money will come from the EU budget for granted, but you know EU budget is small. It's only 1% of public expenditure in EU, okay? It's very, very, very small. Very important for Latvia, for instance. Okay, most of you are from Latvia. 
65% of all public investment is reliant on EU funds, okay? Latvia is very, very dependent. It's like drugs, okay? It's like drugs. There's a needle at some top spot behind, right? A lot of EU money coming in. Road, for instance, if there's no EU money, the roads will start to dilapidate. The commission has said, please put more money into smart mobility, okay? Well, you know, there's not that much money. So the EU budget, you know, it's small money. It's about 15 billion. And then we add to this sort of a little bit of money from the emissions trading system, okay? The way that we trade uh, opportunities to pollute, okay? And we put this into a fund, okay? Into sustainable investment fund, the, the sort of the next generation of InvestEU, okay? And then we have also a bit of a job transition mechanism. The 7.5 billion that Professor Volteri has talked about. That's fresh money, that's new money, okay? All of this was already planned last year, two years ago, when the commission offered uh, the budget, okay? So we also have a very interesting bank, the Finn Investment Bank, which is EU's bank, you know, which is a financial, the largest financial institution, development financial, many, many times bigger than the World Bank, in fact. The World Bank has 10,000 employees, European Investment Bank has 7,000, much more efficient uh, operation, okay? Let's her know it can finance. A lot of projects have said that it will not finance fossil projects from 2025, zero, none, okay? And it will do half of its operations in climate finance, okay? So Estonians, Lithuanians are using a lot of investment bank loans. Latvia has been somewhat conservative. There's a lot of opportunities there. National Commercial Bank, international financial institution, Altun, and his left, but his institution has a key role to play. 25% of the EU money can go now through national banks, national financial institutions, 75% European investment bank. That's from the EU budget. Then we also have structural funds still, right? Less of cohesion money, smaller budget, Brexit, UK is leaving, the money's smaller, but we still have quite a bit of money in structural funds for green, uh, green investment. And then we have public and private money, okay? So this public fund, you know, this guaranteed money uh, serves as a, as a way to crowd in uh, private investment. So we want to increase funding for the transition. We need more money, that's for sure. We want to create a good framework, you know, good laws, good regulations. Volterius already spoke about that, so I'll not repeat it. So we have a number of directions in which the EU is going. We have green bond standard. Reynish spoke at length uh, quite um, in, a, in a way that, you know, he was advertising what he did. Of course, compared to Scandinavia, you know, the SEB and Swedbank, I mean, they issue green bonds, you know, every other day. You know, here they have issued it for the first time, and that's a big deal. That just shows how far Latvia, the Baltics, really have to go. But that's great that we're in Northern Europe, that we have a lot of experience, okay? So we want to create an enabling network so that the green bond that some of the issues is really verifiably green. Otherwise, there is a risk of what is called greenwashing. We call green what is really not so green, okay? You know the film Fifty Shades of Grey, okay? Now they talk about the Fifty Shades of Green, okay? In Africa, in some countries, they have 50 names for uh, red color because Earth, you know, is so red shades of red, right? So we need to be able to differentiate what is truly really green, okay? What are the bonds from the proceeds of which we finance really green projects? And then we need to be able to say, well, these bonds are quite green, but not as green as the very green bonds, okay? So we need to benchmark. We need a rule or we need to somehow establish, and this is what is the green bond standard, okay? That's why it's important to have good rules, good standards, what is green and what is not green, okay? And then, of course, we need to provide a lot of support to public administrations and the project promoters, okay? So we need to have support. Now, this is where you guys come in, okay? You are associated with the finance industry. Professor Volterio spoke about EU action plan for sustainable finance. Well, that's an old plan, right? It's uh, from 90, uh, from 20, not 19, okay? It's not that old, okay? It's from 2018, okay, 2018. Now, of course, we have the new Green Deal. It's much more ambitious. So we, the EU, we together, Europeans, will have a new strategy. It's called the Sustainable Finance Strategy. We have some ideas in the Commission what should be in this strategy, but it's really up to you, you know, the industry, to improve it, okay? So what we have launched is we have just launched, and I'm looking at Yanis, because Latvia Finance Association has been really a good partner to the Commission. We have a number of memoranda signed, and they really put in some very, very good ideas how this EU Action Plan for Sustainable Finance could be improved. And now I implore you, I urge you, you know, to actively, for 12 weeks, okay, 12 weeks, since, since you know, for four months, okay, um, 
to, to, to hear from the stakeholders. You know, what should be in this sort of new iteration of the sustainable strategy uh, for green growth? Okay? We will have a number of other things, you know, the Just Transition Fund, biodiversity, social economy, climate law. But I really want to address this to you. Please go to the Commission website. Please find the public consultation. Please look at what's in the strategy and make your voice heard. You know, you may think, look, you know, whatever I say, you know, little dog is still Tatiana, you know, doesn't really matter, okay? A little non resident bank in Latvia doesn't matter, okay? EU financial industry is big and mighty. It does. It does matter. Every voice counts, every opinion matters, okay? And then we will publish the future strategy. And this tells you, you know, these EU documents are not developed as sort of my desk, you know, some bureaucrat writing something. These are developed in close association with the industry. So we publish it at quarter three of 2020. And what will be, what are our things, our thoughts uh, to date, uh, what should be uh, in the strategy? So we need to strengthen the, the sort of the, the very foundations of sustainable investment, sort of the definitions, you know, the taxonomy, which really looks at every industry and says, is this industry green? Is it contributing to climate change? Or is it hurting climate change? The mitigation, adaptation, is it circular? Or is it linear economy? Okay, so taxation, taxonomy is one. Green bond standard is another. Now we have two developed, uh, Professor Pothurius already spoke, two benchmarks uh, developed for sort of benchmarking industry. Um, that's, you know, the, the sort of important part. Strengthen the foundation. Then we need to increase opportunities for investors and companies, okay? And this is where sort of labels for retail investment products, the green bond standards, you know, this sort of uh, thing, things uh, come in. And then we also need to um, sort of manage uh, climate and environmental risks in whatever we do, okay? So we need to integrate these risks into our thinking. I think for the debate, we will talk a little bit how to square this math of profitability. I mean, our portfolios, you know, our obligation to the investors is to make the portfolios profitable, right? To make profit for the investors. How to square the circle, okay? How to put environment, green, you know, sustainable into this math, this, this equation of profitability. Can green be profitable? Is green always just investment? Can green, at what point can it be profitable, okay? How do we build green portfolios, okay? And for Latvia, this is incredibly important. Latvia needs to turn the corner, okay? The country for a long time has been reliant on money which is not earned here, on servicing money which is going through the system, money which is gray, green or brown or black, and this has been a growth model. This growth model has not been sustainable. This is not circular economy. This is not the future. This is not the European Green Deal. The industry needs to pay a lot of attention to comply. This is an important week for the industry. In fact, this is decisive week for Latvian finance industry. The industry needs to change. I propose sustainable finance. Thank you, Martin. Really engaging and I'm looking forward for discussions. So uh, straight from the floor and the standing and inspiring us, I would love to ask you to join the the expert discussion panel uh, with the topic like challenges of the green transformation in the field of finance. So welcome, take a first seat uh, into this like a panel discussion and uh, along with other experts which I'm gonna invite. So you heard already Mr. Sain is like Berzinch, joint stock company, development finance institution Altum, welcome. Mr. Jan is Brazowskis, representative from uh, Finance Latvia Association. Welcome. And Natalia Cudečka Purinja is representative from BA School of Business and Finance as well as Leopa University, so academic field. So I'll ask you to show, show your names fully to the audience. So the first question which I would love to ask, uh, maybe I will uh, let Martin Zemit is to take a breath after inspiring the speech. Uh, so and uh, asked, uh, so the first question would go for this like a finance Latvia association. So how actually financial institutions feel their role and how they play their role in this like uh, implementing this European green deal. So is it like just giving a money and that's it? So finding the spot into their portfolios and like changing it or how, how what's their role? How do you think? Yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you, Martin. Uh, first of all, thank you for invitation and thank you for those uh, good presentations that we had. So uh, our role, uh, obviously, it's a very very important role because uh, uh, this uh, green deal can couldn't be done uh, just uh, relying on uh, public finances. So and. Uh, uh, blended finance is, 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 a, is a very important and certainly uh, we consider that as a, a very opportunity for our uh, whole country and it's not just a sort of obligation on compliance with obligations uh, what will come from the uh, EU. Uh, we at the Finance Latvia and also our members are considering this as a real opportunity to change the, uh, our economy and just to be pioneers in that and also probably it's a very good uh, strategy to grow. And uh, as early as last year, we just established a working group on a sustainable finance in um, Finance Latvia. So, and uh, during the half a year uh, last year, we prepared the uh, first draft of our uh, position on a, on, a, on a green deal in sustainable finance. So uh, that's gonna be a very, uh, how to say, principle-based first, first approach. But, uh, uh, wh what do you consider what's very important for us? It's a, first of all, it's a building the confidence within mm -hmm. the finance industry and also within the probably other in industries and, the, and transforming that confidence to, the, to the our customers and really just to encourage them to be a green and not to consider the green as a just a compliance with the regulations. It's a real possibility also to change your business and also just be very transparent with our customers and say that probably in the longer run, we will not be able to finance you because you are not going to be uh, sustainable and you are not going to be green compliant. <laughs> and also for that purpose, it's a very important that, that we consider that transparency is a very important. It's a data, how we are collecting data, how we are just uh, assessing our customers, how we're assessing our portfolios that we are really green. And that's why we are expecting that uh, taxonomy and we are uh, waiting for the taxonomy in order just to be real, very explicit on that. And also, I think that we if, if we talk about the data, it's also very important just to, to think in the terms how we can use this digital transformation for the data. Mm -hmm. And also use new technologies to collecting of the data and just to derive all the uh, exact information what we need in order just to finance our projects. And definitely we're encouraging everyone also to, 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 to think about uh, those uh, green bonds and to think about the diversity of financing and not just rely on a probably traditional uh, uh, loans and traditional lenders. So we also are t uh, transforming our industry as a quite right much and Martin mentioned. We, we are transforming, we are going through the changes and we consider that this green deal also can, can could be uh, some sort of uh, bolster of our economy and also promoting of our international repute and not just uh, and put our ourselves and our country on a, on a map as a real sustainable and green uh, country in a good sense of the word, because sometimes we are just uh, considering that green is something bad and just uh, new regulations, how our traditional uh, uh, incumbents will survive. We think that uh, it's a real opportunity for us also to, 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 re to, to rethink whole economy and not just to think in the terms uh, to comply with EU policy, which is a very important, definitely, but uh, it's not a, a, a about the compliance, it's real opportunity to just to, to put our, our back on a, on a map. Mm -hmm. And also just to boost our ca ca competitiveness internationally. Mm -hmm. Very good, then uh, let's give a word as well to Martin Jusemidis. So how, how do you see that this, like, this is ambition to being educated and as well like revise their own plans when they're like running this green finance and looking forward to implementation of this European Green Deal. Do you see similarities as well in other countries? So is this the expectation from this like uh, finance industry? Is this the role that there should be like a played um, in this transparency and, explana and explanatory part as well? So what, what, what do you see that? Thank you for the question. I mean, obviously we speak of a European Union, of a banking union, of a capital markets union, but it's not perfect. I mean, there's lots of diversity between different member states. I mean, here in the Baltics, we have a relatively small market. I mean, think of a country we just exited the EU, London with its city. I mean, they have a bit of a different uh, sort of set of challenges than, than sort of the Baltic capital market. But overall, I think green can be a growth strategy for the European financial industry overall. I mean, the EU is giving a few tools. I mean, some regulations, you know, some uh, you know, some, some, some strategic guidance. 
But it is really up to the sector to devise its own development strategy, right? I mean, each bank sort of tries to find its way towards profitability. I mean, how to serve the investors, how to, how to serve the depositors better. And of course, to, to make money, to, 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 to earn. I mean, Reynis is happy because he doesn't have to, to make money. I mean, he makes money, but I mean, he reinvests it. Okay, he doesn't really go for profit at the development institution. The World Bank, the EIB, you know, they cannot really make profit by, by definition. So does the EU, the EU cannot be, you know, it has to be in balance. But commercial banks, the commercial sector, the honest sector, you know, they have to make money. And what I'm proposing is that, you know, there's a few economic, really big trends out there. You know, one is green and one is digital, okay? And so the banks would do well if they, if they really jump on this bandwagon of green, because this green wave is waving, is, is sort of rolling through the economy, right? So the ones which will be the first movers, you know, the sort of the, the, the infant industries, the, the first mover advantages, right? So they'll reap the benefits. And so those banks and institutions in Latvia, and that's why I really applaud Latvia, and the whole Baltics really applaud Latvia development institution. The Estonians and Lithuanians are looking in awe towards Altum, saying, you moved with a, with a green bond, okay? This green bond activates the capital market of the whole Baltic states, right? We're building sort of this capital market of the Baltic states. And, you know, from EU perspective, we very much support, you know, kind of the unification because it's altogether, you know, not even eight million, you know, the capital markets, you know, for this area to be uh, competitive. The Baltics need to work together, okay? They really need to work together. Then they are somewhat interested, interesting for outside investors. These first green bonds will be interesting, but, you know, for this region to attract the interest of large institutional investors, large groups, you know, Blackstones, et cetera, you know, large equity firms, this region will need to be working together. And the same thing with that green finance. I think there's, you know, Baltic Innovation Fund too is a very good example we can, we can talk about that. But yes, there's lots of opportunities and the EU is giving some tools and also quite a bit of money, you know, to make this happen here in the Baltic States. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you also feel that this, uh, there is a role how to like, as, as, as Yanis as well mentioned about this, like a blending finance. So is it like a good understanding at the moment on like, uh, how do you feel on the finance industry sector? So how to do that part, or there is there still a lot of, lot to learn? Uh, well, what is that? blending? Blending is sort of, you know, putting together public money and private mm -hmm. money, okay? Using EU grants or grant national and local grants and, and putting it together with, with sort of loans and then, you know, other financial instruments. Okay, that's blended. I mean, Reynis has, you know, a wonderful presentation of of how this multiplicative and this sort of leverage effect works, how it really works. It, it enables to pull in, in private money. There's lots of technical difficulties. Of course, there's state aid rules from EU side, you know, lots of uh, red tape, and it's not always easy. Uh, the EU promotes it, but uh, there's lots of stumbling blocks, okay? What we achieve, aim to do is we make to aim it, aim it simpler. I think blended finance is the future, I agree with Giannis. Um, it's not easy. We need to educate the, the industry. We need to work through practical examples, demos, you know, pilot projects of, of how to do blended finance. It's not easy finance, but it allows to give more bang for the buck, as the Americans say. You know, with less money, you can do more impact. Okay, that's why blended finance is good because we'll never have all the money in the world. We have small public money. We have to be responsible because this is public money, money that we as taxpayers pay. Okay, but blended finance allows us to do more, and this is circular because blended money returns and then you can invest in new projects. With regular grants, you take the money and you, and you put the money and then it amortizes and the investment is gone. With circular money, with blended finance, you can make the same money go round and round and round and make more and more investment and make, support more and more projects. So that's why blended finance is so beautiful, okay? Thank you, Martin. Uh, then let's guess, discuss a bit like, uh, around like motivation on the like, financial institution side. So we hear that there are like, different structures, how you can like, blend money and there's a great deal uh, at the end. So uh, Yanis mentioned about this, like, that there is sustainability group already created. Uh, so how do we feel that is there a motivation enough that this and belief that the European Green Deal direction is like a next growth strategy for the like, uh, banks as well? So, is, is there a motivation inside? Yeah, yes. Or, yeah, or there is a, yeah, certainly there is a very big motivation. Uh, first, uh, first of all, definitely we, we, we know that the regulations are, are going to be there. And so we as a, any 
financial institution in the in the Europe will have to comply with them. And if the regulation is going to be there, then definitely it's better for you to be prepared for that and just to get uh, uh, not just uh, regulation from that out, but probably try to get uh, the best products, how you can just uh, steam out from uh, from that the profit for uh, for yourself, for your customers, and also for for your shareholders. So we consider that as a real a real possibility. Uh, first of all, uh, then you, you, you we should think about the immediate steps. First of all, I think it's very important to based on a and everyone thinks that it's very important just to make a risk assessment and just to 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 to, to look on your portfolios and look on your uh, products and um, uh, through that uh, perspective of green financing. And uh, just uh, to, 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 to adjust and to, to make a specific products for your customers. And also just to raise a, a awareness of your customers about those uh, green regulations and the possibilities, what it gives uh, to, to the customers. So uh, we, we, there is a motivation, and the motivation is not just to be compliant, but we think that it's a real possibility also to, to make us uh, more profitable, to make us more agile, and also just to to boost up our customers in order just uh, you know make us uh, more for sustainable certainly it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a not an easy task definitely there is a room for a cooperation and public private partnership but uh, we think that we should start rather earlier than than later that's why we are uh, we are doing it right now and uh, we are first of all we are just uh, we'll try to you know, deliver the message to the to the, all our members, uh, just to, to be prepared to look on your portfolios right now, and just to prepare your um, you know green deal strategies, and also uh, try to deliver to the, your customers. So that's uh, that's our one one step, and the, the second one is also the cooperation with uh, with uh, our uh, peers in the public public sector it's a it's a very important that's why we are very happy that uh, autumn is us and uh, those are the things and definitely about the, the the transparency taxonomy and and data you know not just to make a data for the sake of data but uh, really get something meaningful from that data which helps us to 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 build up a new product and also regarding the capital markets i think that uh, that uh, that is not a secret the capital market probably is some some sort of adornment in our country and we think that uh, probably those green financing bonds and other bonds will just uh, boost up the capital market as well and we think that probably also that uh, initiative on a, on a covered bonds and to establish a uh, one uh, Unified regulation for covered bonds in a, in a Baltics is is, uh, is a, uh, also a very you know beneficial for uh, establishing of uh, new financing uh, possibilities for uh, for our, our businesses through those uh, uh, covered bonds and probably covered bonds as al uh, also as a green bond. So uh, a lot of a lot of motivation is there. But a lot of uh, you know task, not probably very easy task, and also we probably have to change our uh, mindset as well because we couldn't rely on a on an incumbent framework and a incumbent frames what we do have on our tables right now. Mm -hmm. And I would have like uh, question to Rainis as well. Uh, so competition wise, so if we take a look on those like offerings which are coming from like supportive. Uh, like governmental organizations and so like a finan financial I industry. So how do you feel? So is it from the company side who is wanting like to invest some money? Are they looking on this like a green type of like a product as like an option or you have to like educate them or uh, they, they would love to maybe step more on the riskiest products more and like to gain some benefits out of that and like, earn more. How do you feel that is there is like a, um, the feeling that you can gain more from this like a green type of the products rather than this like a riskiest ones. Yeah, I guess the, the closest uh, word could be, as you said, education. We do a lot of uh, kind of education, a lot of seminars, and we have also some surveys which shows that actually in Latvia, uh, for example, bill for uh, electricity is the first, actually the biggest bill, right? And a lot of also companies says that, um, uh, look, we have to, we, we spend a lot there and we know that perhaps we could do some kind of energy efficiency measures and so on. 
but somehow a lot of a uh, lot of CEOs, CFOs don't choose this as an option. They said, okay, on this particular year we could use our capex. I don't know to buy. I don't know more premises or do something else. So this is the very often answer we got. So uh, this is one of the reasons why we also designed this program, which I also showed, and we are saying, okay, if you have like capex for buying another premises or something like that, do that. For us, it's enough if you will show that your new machinery will be more energy efficient, and it will be said not by Rainis because I'm good on finances or other things, but I'm not very good by calculating electro efficiency, right? We have particular uh, uh, part particular persons in Altum who are with the uh, education in this field, if they show that uh, the cash flow will be uh, better uh, during those next three, five years, uh, it will be smaller. Uh, it's enough, as I said in uh, my presentation, that it could be kind of collateral to receive this loan and we are saying, okay, you don't need to have more collateral and so on. And that's also good for the banks because banks have their own Basel requirements for example, Basel III requirements, and then there is this fourth, and so on. A lot of things which they need to calculate where they are giving uh, the loan, right? They need to calculate a lot of things have to be uh, put as a kind of money aside as a, uh, uh, for the possible losses and so on, right? So we can, uh, we can active, uh, be more active, uh, more free, also providing this type of loan. Uh, but of course, our uh, interest rate for that loan is higher than usually. It also should be mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you, you feel that there is demand? Is there already demand from this? Now it is, yeah. But it took some two years actually. Now it's getting better, and we were able in December to uh, sign contract with EIB uh, for the next uh, portion for this particular program because they offered also. Mm, we are not like it's uh, as Martin said that. Uh, our main task is not to get a profit, but we still are state-owned company, and as soon as our uh, legal form is company, we also need to take care about our finances. We are very following also mm -hmm. uh, how to cheaper attract the money, which we can then launch to the project. So there was very good pro also this cooperation with EIB now, and we are looking forward for this uh, program. And in this program, uh, we will see how it will go, but uh, uh, the, the beginning was harder. Now it's getting better we can attract more money because we feel that there will be enough projects to launch that yeah but it was quite hard also to, to change this mindset because uh, as i said very often it was a typical uh, answer yes we know that we need to be more energy efficient but we don't want to do that because we don't want to put our capex our capital expenditures to particular objects and this program was kind of answer but it took uh, some promoting time yeah so there's, and then I would love to hear the comment from as well from the Martin side. You you touched a bit this like profitability in general. So, uh, from is is there an answer for financial inst institution that kind of investing in e European Green Deal? Is there a risk that you are losing something? Of course, the finance industry has a lot of responsibility, you know, towards both depositors and, and creditors. So it has to be prudent. I mean, it's not operating its own money. It's operating other people's money. So of course, the investment, you know, when you see advertisements, in small print, you always have investment carries a risk. You know, the whole amount of investment can be lost. Okay, so, you know, there's that. Therefore, we have sort of prudential requirements, right? Uh, it can be risky. I mean, uh, it, can be, it can be profitable. It's the same as with, uh, with green technologies, right? I mean, at some point, wind energy is not profitable. Right, because you need to have double tariff to make it profitable. You have other subsidies or tax rebates or tax stimuli to make it profitable. But then there's lots of research, right? Goes into the, the sort of the wind and solar energy at Stanford, my alma mater. You know, there is uh, a green energy week. You know, they're doing a lot of research on making green energy more efficient. So as technologies are improved, also financial instruments get improved. You know, we have a better assessment. You know, better tools to assess the risks which are inherent in green projects, right? The more green projects we have, the more big data we have, the better our models become, right? I mean, you know, this is for the financial industry. The European Commission officials should not be, you know, talking about risk models, but I mean, that's, that's how it is. So the, you know, the more critical mass, the more traction there is for supporting green, you know, the better the models become, the more profitability can, can, be, can be gained. Some technologies are profitable, some are not yet profitable, okay? There are ways to leverage risks, okay? to buy insurance for these projects. So that should be, that should be done. 
But I'm happy to see that, for instance, you know, even in, a, in Riga City, where, where, which, is, which is not particularly green in terms of green technology, you know, we have some interesting experimental projects. You know, for instance, uh, Juncker Plan or InvestEU has supported a project of hydrogen trolley buses in Riga, okay? So hopefully, in March, you will be able to step into a trolley bus, which is not powered by diesel or gasoline and buses. It's not powered by electricity, but it's powered by hydrogen. Okay, so let's hope that this has been a long project. In Netherlands, the station exploded. Okay, so there are some risks, right? So let's hope that, you know, there's better ventilation in, in Riga and we ha can have the buses, the trolley, trolley buses are already here, okay? And the banks have been involved, right? So the European Investment Bank is the big anchor investor. Then we also have, you know, a, a local, a Scandinavian bank, and also Nordic Investment Bank has been, has been involved because this project is innovative technology. It's green technology. It's the future. It's the European Green Deal. So there's more and more projects. The more projects there are, you know, if the covered bond can be done as a green bond, that would be great. Okay, that would be that would be simply fantastic. Okay, because these are trailblazers. These are the torch bearers. You know, uh, Reynis is really the first mover in the market, right? With this green bond. Okay, this is nothing spectacular for Scandinavia, but this is a great deal for the Baltics. You know, as Neil Armstrong used to say, this is a small step for me, but but a big step for mankind. mankind. Yeah. Okay. I, I compared you with Neil That's for history. So it's, it's, on, it's, on, it's on web stream, okay? So, you know, your wife can check it, okay? <laughs> and there's something Just that to add on, on this, uh, uh, the, yeah, but we also shouldn't uh, uh, underestimate uh, uh, the, the, the importance of, uh, of a public finance and, uh, uh, and public capital. Because definitely in this transition, what we are going to have, commitment of uh, public capital can serve as an unlock for a for a public uh, for a private financing, so and I uh, and particularly on in a, probably in our countries and economies like in a, in us that that's a very important that the public uh, public finances also just sent a very strong message uh, where they are going to invest because they are really can serve as a unlockers for mm -hmm. for, for for us as a as a as a you know uh, private financers. And so that's in a presentation of, uh, of uh, Riggs Bank, what they did with uh, those and getting rid of uh, their investments, which they didn't consider as a sustainable. It's a very good example how also public finance sent a very clear message mm -hmm. where you should be invest and where you should um, uh, commit yourself. And also this transition definitely, unfortunately probably, will render common knowledge obsolete. So then we we also are talking about the new common knowledge, new public awareness, and also new skills what we, everyone, will have to have. Not just the financiers, not just the who are in the finance industry, but everyone, in order just to be sustainable and be profitable. Yeah, thanks. I think that this not only like a blended finance, but as well like the blended mindset should be in every like deal which we are making that there is some part where already this uh, sustainability and the green part is like a being a part and uh, already incorporated in the risk, risk models rather than just seeing that as an alternative rather than being like that should be like a part. Then the question maybe from academia side and uh, from for Natalia Tsudechka Purinya on the, the experience from the state side. So what could be like those but the role of the gov governmental organizations and uh, uh, probably e especially Latvian governmental organizations, how to encourage as well like financial industry to take those steps further in order to like, integrate this green thinking uh, into their products that they are creating? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, well, actually, I'd say that uh, in order to ensure that uh, the tra transition to the, well, in implementation of circular economy issues and Green Deal especially, uh, it's very important for the state to show the vision that, that the, the government has currently and, and uh, in the long term. And uh, well, as for me, I'm working also in the Ministry of Environment, uh, it's important to uh, stress the cooperation because well, actually, some five years ago, for example, we started to talk more actively about circular economy, which was mm -hmm. also the uh, first initiative prior to, to the Green Deal. And uh, what we saw that um, 
as a Ministry of Environment, we, st we were struggling to get, for example, Ministry of Finance on board because they said that, okay, circular economy stuff, that's mostly uh, linked with, with waste management, with environmental issues, so it's not our business. Mm -hmm. And it was our uh, mission to uh, explain to them and to uh, encourage them to, to involve and to, to get, uh, so to say, on board uh, on these actions. And now what we can see uh, well, uh, across Europe, for example, that uh, from 28 member states, already 13 member states have the circular uh, economy strategy or action plan in place. So the same is going on to happen with the Green Deal. And uh, Latvia already has uh, mm, developed an informative report on Green Deal, which was prepared by our ministry. And uh, well, this also sets, uh, sets a vision how can we communicate uh, the uh, entrepreneurs, how can we uh, communicate the financial sector. So for them also to see that they're not doing something on, on well, a standalone basis, but they have uh, well, state vision and the government uh, showing that, for example, for, for Latvia we can see that this or that direction is better and we can go in, in for example, sharing economy or, or that other types of, of um, uh, business sectors as a focus or as a prior priority sectors. And so this is, I guess, this is the most important, uh, well, for them to understand that uh, not only the banks are on their, their own developing uh, green products for, for the companies, but that there is a vision, a clear vision from the government, uh, well, showing that which is the right direction for, for the businesses to develop in, in the, within the uh, Latvian economy and uh, for the banks how they can support and uh, which types of, of products they can offer which, which would be most appropriate for example for, the, for our entities here. Mm -hmm. Thank you and then uh, previously Reynis you I mentioned that you are a flagship on this like a journey onto this like European uh, Green Deal and issuing these green bonds. Do you see and can you find a specific role from this like support de development like organizations which are supporting uh, another like financial institutions as well so uh, can you give some tips and tricks or like the first encouragement what is like a starting point for those companies which are also onto this like a journey as prob probably it's important that we have those not only one effective agents which are helping to tell the story but uh, pretty much like several of, of them so I guess uh, the whole presentation was about that, right? Mm -hmm. So our experience and our tips, so I will not figure it out once again. I just can show our experience and just say that two and a half years after, we feel quite safe about this trip. We are very satisfied because of the reason that now capital markets knows us. As I also mentioned, we started with the yield 1.3. Now we were in l on last year with 0 0.95, obvious, right? Because those guys are like 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 voting with their wallets, right? Our investors, simple as it is. So we see that uh, when will be our first uh, bond issue? I guess the, the the path will be the same or even better. I also can uh, suggest highly to for those large companies also take uh, uh, credit rating because it's very uh, important thing not only to show outside but also to uh, to make your house internally in order and it also very helps uh, not only issue bonds but also when you are going to I don't know some bigger organizations and they can either uh, y use the time and make a due diligence and so on or just when you just showing this rating it helps a lot really a lot right and the third thing is uh, also if you have a good program if you feel that you are on the or in uh, what everything uh, very appreciate what everything also Martin said and uh, how uh, he is acting on behalf of uh, European Commission and trying to promote all those things which are um, connected with the green policy, with the translating with the green policy, because it's very often uh, wrong interpreted, right? And, and, and I guess it's a, a tough job to do, but I guess it's very good to do. I guess we, if we see that it's kind of policy, not only in Latvia, but also in uh, Europe's level, then we understand that we cannot miss with this uh, kind of uh, design program, right? And I guess uh, because a lot of uh, lot of uh, explanation work is now currently taking place in Latvia, and more and more companies are switching to those green projects. This is at least what we can feel, at, at least from our pipeline. It's not a huge one, but if we are comparing percentage, the interest, it's raising year by year. So simple as it is. Mm -hmm. 
Anything wanted Martin to add on this like uh, journey, how to create more effective agents on the financial institution side? So maybe some good examples on the other countries. So are there any good Well, we, we know that, uh, you know, the Finance Latvia Association has a caucus, has a group of um, a ad hoc group on sustainable finance where the banks, at least those agents of change within the banks, are regularly, you know, coming together and sharing best practices. I mean, luckily here in Latvia we have, you know, daughter companies and, and sort of branches of, of Scandinavian banking groups because in Scandinavia this is quite advanced. Green finance is quite advanced. The green bonds started in Sweden, okay? They have, they have really moved quite, in, in Finland, they're quite, they're quite advanced. Uh, finance Latvia is regularly bringing uh, banks, public sector, development institution people, you know, to, to Oslo, to Helsinki, to Stockholm, to London, uh, to, to learn, to exchange best practices. So within the banking industry, I think it's very healthy that there's a lot of learning. You know, this, this is part of what the Finance Latvia says, you know, they want to develop, okay? They have compliance, you know, they have sort of, you know, obeying the, obeying the laws, but they also want to see technology, innovation, development, and, and they are self-educating themselves. But this is not only about the industry, this is not about banking and finance, okay? This is more so about the projects, the investment projects, the project promoters, okay? It's about a farmer, you know, who wants to do his project green or doesn't. It's about, uh, you know, the, the sort of, uh, I don't know, somebody who builds a building, you know, a new warehouse, installs a new line, or, or takes care of their energy efficiency, okay? Transport sector is a biggie. Tomorrow I have a big talk where I have to preach the, the green deal uh, to the transport sector. Uh, clean transport and the Green Deal, okay? Transport is a biggie. In Latvia, the transport sector is one of the oldest in Europe, okay? We have old cars. Our car park is old. We're buying still old German cars, okay? Germans are happy to get rid of them, you know? Yeah, it's free movement of goods within the EU, but, uh, you know, we have to. And then also municipal car parks. I mean, you know, this transition to, to electromobility, okay? There's a lot of a uh, lot of things that the banks can do is, you know, to, to finance the charging stations, the, the buying of electric vehicle. Electric vehicles are still quite a bit more expensive than regular vehicles. The cheapest one is 20,000 new Volkswagen, okay? I checked all the prices, Tesla about 80, 100,000. It's still expensive, okay? We will need to finance the car, okay? We'll need the bank to be able to give us a good rate for the leasing of the car, okay? This is green deal, okay? In Sweden, the banks are giving better interest rate Anders would not let me uh, lie on this one. Is it true? The bank is giving SEB or Swedbank, which are operational here in Latvia, if you go and you, you tell them, I want to do my project energy efficient, I want to build my home. My own home is extremely energy efficient. It's almost a passive home, okay? I went to a bank, well, two banks, in fact, Scandinavian banks, and I told them, my brother's an architect, I have a very, very energy efficient home. Can you give me a better interest rate because I'll be saving the planet, okay? Well, they said, look, you know, already our interest rate is, is so low that, you know, we have no, you know, we cannot really go deeper. I have to make a little bit of, you know, commission, you know, the agent tell me. Well, I, I got no better, infra I mean, my interest rate is still incredibly good, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's n no bonus for being energy efficient. So we really need, there's, there's real work to do, okay? The banks here really has to internalize the European Green Deal, okay? We need to be able to give incentives to the consumers you know, we need to nudge, okay? And the finance industry really also needs to shape up, you know? We need to be able to give better interest rates or some other bonuses, some other incentives. Because the green technologies and projects are still quite expensive, but we need to change the mindset somehow, right? So I implore, if there's somebody from the management of, of the big uh, Scandinavian banks, call your, uh, call your boss in, in, in Stockholm and ask them, why do you offer better interest rate in Stockholm than you do to Latvia for energy efficient home? You know, why, why is this, okay? We have a capital market in the EU, right? This may even be illegal, okay? Maybe, allegedly, maybe illegal. Okay, this is too far. But we, what I really see is that we all together need to grow up, okay? We need to open our eyes to the Green Deal. The Green Deal is coming, it's not gonna go away. We better take advantage of it, okay? All of you, wherever you work, in your daily work and in your business, morning, evening, and during the day, think green, bike, Take electric vehicles, share your car. It starts with you, it starts with your decision. Thank you. As I said, yeah, everything starts with a small.
everything starts with the small steps and uh, I clearly hear that kind of when somebody who has like knowledge as uh, here that you are very knowledgeable about that one and you come to this like financial industry and then you ask such type of questions then you would expect that there is already an answer in place so it's not that you are the one who is like trying to educate so and then I'm thinking about this like a demand part uh, of course so one is that we should ed educate the companies, consumers as such, but as well, we have to like educate ourselves quite a lot. And uh, that's why I wanted to ask as well, is there are quite a lot of students who have probably considered the journey in the financial industry and uh, thinking that, okay, hearing those green transition topics here and uh, knowing that it will be a topic at least for whole life, <laughs> let's say so, that uh, how actually like financial education institutions are like helping or like how can they help in order to educate new generation and uh, un how they could understand better the and manage these sustainability topics? Yeah, uh, well, I'd, s I'd start uh, a bit with a, uh, with a step back. Uh, actually, uh, what we have today is that uh, the well, consumer and entrepreneurial behavior and comprehension is that uh, still environmental or green issues are associated with costs, with additional costs, and then, uh, well, if I do invest, how will we, how will I we be better than a competitor because my product will might, might be more costly uh, for the uh, end user. So, and actually this is normal because uh, all the well, entrepreneurs and, and the consumers currently have been uh, uh, educated within the boundaries of linear economy when the resources were infinitive and uh, well, the well, at least the perception of, of this was in place. And now we see that a transformation actually is going on. And if we will, will take a look at the same conference like seven, year, eight years ago, we're not talking mm -hmm. about green, s green issues. Um, well, well um, just, just a handful of people actually was. And uh, it's a pleasure for me actually to see that now we're talking more and more environmental sustainable issues because we understand that actually this is the way forward and this is something that we have to educate the students actually that uh, environmental um, well issues are co well they might be costly at the first well first uh, years of, of impl Im implementation but then on the long term they are sustainable and they are also cutting the costs uh, for the for the companies so this is very important to understand and uh, well also for the entrepreneurs because and and it's also very important that well, some 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 years ago there were pioneers who were doing these environmental issues and um, they had to communicate this uh, for the end user why should the end user choose them but now we see that uh, within the EU these um, green issues are becoming more and more um, well, topical and uh, so they are becoming already a must for for the entities to to uh, to, uh, to to enable the transition to the the circular business models, so um, this is something that that every entity sooner or later would have to implement in order to to comply also with the regulations and with the g good business uh, practices etc. So uh, I say I see that today it's the role of the higher education institutions to um, not only encourage, but also to understand, to explain the students that actually um, green um, finances and, and green issues are here to stay, are not something uh, fashion or trendy stuff. And uh, well, we will have to work within the boundaries of, of green, of sustainable and uh, in the long term. So this is the, the most important, well, I think, and, and uh, this, is, this means actually a, a lot of work to do to the financial um, higher education institutions and actually to, to any type of higher education institutions. So we need to, to get the uh, consumer, the entrepreneurial behavior shift uh, to towards the circular uh, business models. And uh, so this is the, the only way actually to make our businesses sustainable in the long term. For the finance uh, uh, Latvia Association as well, like how do you feel? Is there a competition at the moment regarding the skill level or like skills direction? So is this like green finance already like a need? There is a 
talk, uh, talks around that? Uh, do we feel comfortable about the upcoming future that there will be enough like skilled people who are coming in and like can already manage the sustainability and green uh, green topics? As as uh, it has been like a transition as well from the banking in, in, in like industry as well for this like transparency part and uh, all the anti money laundering stuff where I see that at the moment like focus could be there as well. So how do you feel that is the is it competing at the moment or uh, what are the roles or like tasks for for, yeah, for thank ourselves? You, yeah. Thank you for your question. I I, I think that uh, first of all, since we do have this working group, then. Uh, there is uh, some signs that we do have uh, knowledge and experience and skills in a, in a financial sector and um, also in a sustainable financing issues. So, and we are really lucky with that. Yeah, um, just a one, one minute. And uh, so, but definitely we need to, to build up this um, uh, competence and uh, one of our clear messages uh, will be also to the our uh, institutions that encourage them also to facilitate, uh, to improve their strategies particularly sustainable finance strategies, to revisit uh, uh, products, uh, to revisit uh, channels, how to deliver those sustainable products, and uh, also to revisit requirements towards the customers. And uh, that also means that we definitely will need additional skills and additional people who can just deliver that, assess those risks, and also uh, just to, to make investment decisions, where to invest, how to invest, and also how to explain it to the to the to the customers and make uh, all those things really uh, business wise viable not just mm -hmm. uh, for the sake of a uh, good exercise mm -hmm. so but uh, for the sake of a good growth and good business mm -hmm. so definitely we will need uh, additional skills and we will need um, you know new competences mm -hmm. thank you and uh, do we have uh, uh, we don't have like a uh, doctor on the line, so uh, we don't have, so maybe the one, one sentence from each of you, so this like a f last like a call to action that you would say that the first step that you would say that we have to do now or like tomorrow or in the next week or like the next month uh, towards like this green. Is it like just waiting for regulations or like we can already do something? Doing nothing and waiting for regulation is not a good strategy. Uh, I said, you should bike, you should buy an electric car, read some good literature on, on, on green transition, uh, study a lot of math, you know, that'll be very useful. That's probably the best investment that you can do. Um, and I'm very happy that there are some ideas on creating joint programs on sustainable finance between the universities. Because just as with, you mentioned, with AML, anti-money laundering, you know, the, the bomb hit us and we had no experts, not enough experts, okay? Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a small and diminishing system of education here in this country, but uh, we will need people for Reynis, for Yanis, for the banks, for, for the funds, you know, who, uh, who understand green finance, okay? It's a relic relatively complicated field. There's lots of legislative innovation, okay? To read through these sort of new proposals for directives and regulations, the standards, the benchmarks, the taxonomy, okay? This is all work in progress. It's sort of legislative innovation. And you need to be able to sort of understand the business of this, and you need to be able to understand the economics of this. If the banking university is generous, I have a very nice lecture on the law and economics of energy efficiency in the Green Deal. I'd be happy to give this uh, to the students. I was only able to scratch the very surface and give a lot of a little bit of inspiration. Yeah. Sounds like a plan. So, so we have to like with be green, <laughs> invest in green, and uh, you will have a job. Mm -hmm. uh, once again, I like Martin's passion about that, and I guess uh, one good, very, very good point he mentioned. It's basically the green is here to stay, right? And I guess just take from the rational uh, perspective, if you see that there is possibility to take a loan with smaller collateral, to just do your grinding, go ahead, right? And just use those options because I just totally can agree it's here to stay and just try to find how your company actually, it's not like a something fancy, it's a normal thing now, we need to use that normal. and better use those options while you can and you will see that a lot of instruments uh, is uh, better for those who are doing them like uh, role models the first one. So that's my just rational advice. Mm -hmm. So do I understand correctly that the third round of like issuing green bonds is not the last one? 
It will be the first one. The most likely, it will not be green because we are also yeah. issuing the the I simple uh, bonds. But uh, it's just as, as you are also mentioning, just like like the simple already for the first time. It's I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even in two minutes maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, even <laughs> shorter. Yeah. Yeah, uh, from our part, uh, probably it's uh, just do not consider sustainable uh, finances as something uh, luxury. Uh, there is a real green deal uh, which is uh, here to stay. Everyone has to adjust to that, uh, regardless of regulations. Definitely regulations are very important and to be compliant with regulation is important. But just consider that as a real possibility to revigorate our economy and just to be on a, on a, to be, to become a frontiers of uh, that, at least in Europe and probably also the globally. For that, we definitely will need those skills what the Martin just uh, very likely mentioned, and we are happy just to share our views and our skills for, uh, with everyone in order just to promote that idea uh, as, a, as a business idea. Thank you. And I will be quite short uh, in this. Uh, I think that the most important is the change in entrepreneurial and uh, consumer behavior. And uh, as we see that there are, there are real business models that can be adopted, um, just, just go ahead and use them. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you everybody for a fruitful discussion. So we will end it up and we learned a lot about this like grid transition and uh, I like the really the saying that every everything starts from ourselves as well. So read eat green as well exercise which also turned out which is good for people so thank you everybody and we'll be back at uh, half past 12 on the second part of this plenary session on the digital transition and so
uh, welcome back after uh, a break, uh, which followed after our morning session of this uh, annual Scientific Baltic Business Management Conference, where we are tackling and talking about business and finance and multi perspectives of, the, of them, like in the digital, digital age. And the morning part we spent on the one part of transformation, which was green transformation. So fruitful discussions uh, will be followed as well uh, now with real actions and uh, real small steps to take as well. And we are uh, tackling the second part of this plenary session, which will be another type of uh, transformations. Uh, it will be digital transformation. And from one point of view, probably the digital transformation, it might feel that this is a buzzword and that there is a question, aren't we already digital enough and is there something to, to transform at all? But probably there is a quite a lot. And um, we have to understand that probably world will never be so slow as it is today, despite the fact that it's quite fast and technologies are like a driving it. So on the second part of this plenary session, we'll have two presentations and then we'll have like discussion and we'll end up around like half past uh, two o'clock. So in order to start uh, this, this topic as, as, as such, I would love to ask to come to the stage uh, Mr. Kristaps Banga, which is Innovation and Partnership Lead from Accenture Latvia uh, with the topic Intelligent Digital Transformation. Let's welcome with a warm round of applause. Christophs. Just swing me one five minutes, Charlotte. Yeah, cool. Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to see you. Uh, to be honest, uh, I will not uh, follow with a very academic speech. I, I'm not used to. I'm more entrepreneurial. So excuse uh, and pardon my English if, if some words are not very academic. Uh, <coughs> but yes, I will lead towards uh, transformation, digital transformation. But I would really would like to add this part of the intelligent layer. I believe, I believe it's somehow connect also with this green attitude and green thinking. So it, it is uh, uh, also some intentions of the intelligence behind the uh, intelligence of uh, keeping our world safe and about circular economy. But just to start, uh, why it gets messy and why it doesn't always these transformations happen as easy as that? And uh, it's maybe not kind of quite clear uh, what, what it meant by this mess on the screen. So, but uh, uh, I meant with this uh, dust. And if you look actually in the vocabulary, then it uh, comes up very interesting definition. It's a, like a very basic, straightforward. But if you think from technology side, if you think from the business side, what is equals, it's a legacy. And legacy is uh, like a dust. It's not just a fixed legacy. It comes over and over. You, you, you try to clean it out, but it still pops up. And it's actually one of the blockers to get the house clean, to get the vault clean. And this is actually will be what I will be going through this uh, presentation. How actually we need to think through and what are the components uh, so we can uh, get to the better results. So moving from the what to do, because uh, this is a very straightforward, right? Uh, bigger clouds, uh, faster uh, mobile networks. Uh, uh, better uh, new cars, but these questions, uh, if we want to think about sustainability and intelligence, we need actually to answer why we need to do that and uh, how we need to uh, provide that to, for the end users, whether it's a B2B, whether it's a B2C, and if we will start actually from that perspective, why, uh, what are the challenges or what are the benefits people would like to get and how they would like to experience that, from the user experience side, then actually we, we could come back to the more intelligent approach, right? You have probably seen this slide over and over in social media. I, I'm, I'm using this because I, I have seen that uh, the people like to take pictures in, uh, in conferences. And I think it's a it's very uh, interesting slide to, cause, sorry, back to the uh, uh, voice. <laughs> uh, we talk a lot uh, about diversity. We lo lo talk a lot about the gender diversity. 
uh, but we don't talk a lot about aging uh, and about age diversity, right? I think it's, a, it's also it's important to raise this question. It's maybe not actual for all of us, right? We are pretty innovative, we are pretty active, we are clever, we are still young, but the total, uh, at least Baltic, uh, kind of this uh, competence uh, uh, center, it's, it's, it's getting older and older, but there is also a very good point, right? These people, or the elderly people, they have a lot of uh, experience, uh, which, which is brought between, uh, because of their life, because of the experiences through the different decades. And this empathy, or this EQ, is actually something you can't very quickly just learn on the, whether it's a LinkedIn or some learning boards. Uh, uh, and this is what, in a lot of the cases, also the, for example, very fast forward uh, startups lacking, right? They're lacking empathy. They're la lacking uh, understanding of different segments. And so this is also something about how to do this digital transformation. Yes, you need to have a cool guys and girls on the board who are uh, fluent into the new tech, who understand the, how the new tech should be applied. But you still need also to have these people uh, in, a, in a team who actually values and understands uh, also the whole uh, ecosystem and how the uh, uh, empathy works and they can understand all the touch points, how it will be reflecting these uh, transformational changes. So we, we tap, this is the first, uh, this component I mentioned about the intelligent digital transformation. It is a mindset. And coming back to this statement about the legacy, I still think that the more legacy actually is in our mindsets rather in, in uh, hardware or in some infrastructures, right? And the, the more we will talk within the companies, bigger or smaller, uh, or in the uh, high schools, or academic segment, uh, how to change or how to get more flexible to these uh, agile and different things which change on the go faster than uh, we can adapt different uh, governance models and policies, uh, the better and the easier actually will come also this digital transformation, right? So tech is pretty up to date. We know that the, actually the main blockers are uh, not, not on the tech side, it's more on this uh, mindset and gov uh, governance side. So I would just want to bring very straightforward examples about uh, uh, really doing the things digital or doing uh, digital just for sake of uh, saying that it's a digital, right? We know that a lot of the companies has in, uh, in their uh, visions and strategies, let's go digital. But we know the same examples uh, here in, in, uh, in, uh, in Latvia because uh, there have been just uh, scanned and saved as a PDF a lot of the documents and then it was named that it's a, now it's a digital procedure, right? So it's no OCR involved, no analytics involved, just uh, digital copies of the same uh, paperwork, right? So it's not digital, right? It's a, it's a fake digital. It would be digital if you really would apply uh, a layer of AI, uh, a layer of uh, analytics, and you can really fast forward optimize uh, the outcomes of this uh, new approach, uh, let's say how you procedure some old or new uh, materials, whether it's uh, invoices or whether it's uh, digital books or whatever, right? Uh, it's not a kind of a sales presentation. It's uh, public uh, available uh, research. Accenture uh, conducts every year. It's technology vision. Uh, you can see that uh, all around the public media. It's done in, uh, in collaboration with the biggest universities across the world. Uh, it has an interviews of the top 200 different C-level uh, management people both who does procurement, both who does strategy, both who does infrastructure and these kind of interlocks between the academic uh, predictions and the business requirements is actually behind this uh, research, right? I will just envision two or three things. Uh, as, as I said, you, you can uh, look into this uh, more in uh, media afterwards. But again, uh, the report says not so much about the tech in sake of tech. As I said, yes, we need faster uh, connectivity. Yes, we need more secure clouds. Uh, yes, we need uh, more, uh, more quicker in place, edge computing and all that stuff. But we really need also to kind of think about how actually uh, will that affect the end user? 
or any other user uh, who will be uh, in, in using that, right? So we're talk, uh, talking about the tech clash, uh, and uh, few of the few of the trends uh, which the report uh, covers is about uh, the eye inexperience. So really looking in looking forward, and I will bring also a few examples about that. Uh, AI and me, so it's again, we know that there is a lot of bias about uh, artificial intelligence and how it will uh, affect or uh, is already affecting. More and more smart things are uh, coming in our daily lives, uh, not just as, a, as a small smart things, it's of course also about the robots. So a lot of there is also covered about readiness uh, from the tech side, from the legal side, from the attitude from the people. But also, uh, one of the things talks about the uh, innovation DNA. It also was covered today already, early this morning. So uh, wh how companies uh, design the strategy about the uh, continuous and sustainable innovations, right? So th just to tap uh, very quickly in the, in the first example about the uh, eye in experience, uh, there is interesting uh, name I heard on one podcast. It's about screenagers. Uh, this is about us actually, right? Because we spend so much time in, in a mobile, in a tablet, in the desktop. So uh, it appeared for me uh, surprised there is a term for that. It's a screenagers, right? Uh, and it is so, right? And all the, a lot of the businesses and digital businesses are uh, actually knowing, knowing that fact. They are designing uh, the experience towards that. Uh, for example, Netflix uh, uh, has done the new series for the Black Mirror, where you actually can interactively uh, direct where actually it will lead. Uh, you can direct whether uh, also some sounds will be differently played out, right? So more and more you can actually get into the shoes uh, and blending this reality with your uh, ideas and your uh, uh, willingness where you want to lead, right? So this picture, I, I think you, you know this uh, Matrix movie. So it's really about you can choose, right? What you want to do and what you don't want to do. The other example is more about uh, being more tailored to our needs, right? Uh, I haven't seen, although I haven't used the bolt for a while, uh, Uber states that uh, once ordering Uber, you already can uh, define what type of temperature you want to have in a cab, what type of uh, music you want to have in a cab, uh, whether you want to actually interaction with a cab driver, whether or not, right? So you can actually preset these uh, things once you sit in, uh, you're actually having this uh, experience as you want, right? So it is about uh, new tech, but it enables uh, more uh, experience for the me as a, uh, as a person in a way uh, I would prefer to. Uh, another example from uh, McDonald's, uh, again, it's a global perspective, just to set you in a, in a context, right? Probably this example will not resonate to you, but you know the McDonald's concept is that they want to set that every country, every city has the same experience all, all over the world, right? But what they are now doing, having this more big data and more intelligent and real-time data, is they allowing uh, uh, kind of the employees and the office managers at concrete uh, uh, McDonald's offices that they can actually tailor the experience of the uh, customers. So the dashboards of the uh, uh, dashboards of the products uh, which are on the displays can be adjusted based whether it's on a temperature in that region, whether it's uh, different traffic jams, uh, whether there is a summer event nearby. So they give more and more uh, freedom actually to tailor experience to the, to the end, uh, end uh, office manager. And again, it's very much based on uh, data. So it's not like, hey, I'm Christoph, I just uh, don't like, I don't know, for example, meat, I will not put the meat on the, uh, on the deck, no. It's really uh, driven by, by the data. Uh, and by the intelligence behind that, right? Another example, as I mentioned, is about this uh, uh, bias about the AI uh, and different technologies. Uh, there is this tech clash, right? And on one hand, we want to do this uh, detox of the technologies. We want to we bring more screen, uh, screen, uh, what do you call it? Uh, 
screen time, uh, whether for the kids or for yourself, you're basically trying to avoid uh, this tech uh, too much, right? But at the same time, uh, you expect uh, more uh, tailored approach uh, and uh, different benefits of using this tech, right? So it's uh, pluses and minuses, but at the same time, we don't uh, want to uh, avoid this uh, technology not being an overlap, right? A lot of disruption happens in the healthcare industry. Uh, and this is again uh, something uh, people kind of on one thing and of course with this, uh, with this flavor of GDPR, uh, people on one hand don't want to share a, a lot of their data. On the other hand, uh, you really can do a lot uh, of this positive disruption in the healthcare both for the hospitals who run the business and for uh, us as the end users, right? Uh, so, uh, so there is more and more coming uh, business cases with uh, virtual assistants, virtual therapists, or uh, different uh, gadgets you can track your uh, you can track your health. So it's much quicker for the analysis uh, for the healthcare industry. It's it's much more beneficial for you. So you don't need to have a, a break on your uh, working time to go for, to the hospital. You, do, you can do a lot of things no more and more remotely. So there is a more video, video doctors uh, through the call. Again, adding a layer of uh, computer vision and the voice biometrics, there are already some uh, uh, indicative patterns can be detected. Or you can even uh, do this virtual therapist at home, right? So you can go for a visit to the hospital just for the first visit, do a training program, record that, and then at home, just using your, your uh, existing hardware, you can, uh, by existing uh, camera, now the technology allows that it basically, basically acts the same way like a, a Xbox, right? Like a Kinect, it tracks your body measures, it tracks whether you're doing those uh, exercises correctly according to the program. And again, you saving a lot of the time, hospitals saving a lot of the uh, budget on not, uh, uh, not having uh, premises which are partially used. So again, then, then there is a, a lot of benefits where again, healthcare can invest for a better experience. And that's just uh, one example. How much do I have? Five minutes. Five, five. Okay. So tech is, uh, tech is everywhere, but is really the value here. So we, we touched about the mindset, we touched about the technology progress, and the last but not least, I want to touch also about the, uh, about the business, right? So there is no reason to, do, uh, uh, to change the mindset, to use the technology if there is not a business case at the end of the day, right? So uh, we call it a, it a wise pivot, so probably more for the startups, but also for the big businesses. It is uh, important to understand the, some points where to do these changes. Why? Because disruptions uh, happens, uh, but it's more important actually if you can lead these disruptions. So you can be the disruptor, rather you, could, you would be disrupted by somebody else, right? And actually how you can do that, uh, there will be a classical slide, most probably academic segment uses that uh, as well. Uh, but it's, it's very much about actually the trapped value, right? So, uh, so it's really about this gap. So as, as we ex shared examples, the technology progress is it's really fast forward and accelerating uh, in every minute. But the business, because of the different legacies uh, and uh, also the uh, mindset, actually right behind that and if you overcome that and this is coming back to the bit of the academic if you uh, come back to that and if you uh, do some changes in the core business uh, so example you move uh, uh, for example for the classical I don't know retail to more uh, mobile retail uh, and then you do this uh, incremental kind of a gain and some uh, additional money comes on top of that because you make your business more efficient, you can really uh, look into the identifying new businesses and, and new, not just the business models, but also um, partnership models, uh, new technologies on top of that. And you can grow, already test out different new things. So once the core business, as, as we used to know, is declining, you already will be having some new other offerings, new revenue streams to uh, go it forward. With this, uh, I'm kind of finalizing. Uh, any questions now or later? Later. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you, Kristaps, for your insights. Yeah, intelligent part is really important as well that we are not just rushing here and there. And uh, we will have like chance like to talk with you and also with expert panel. So uh, at the same time, when we have these digital transformations, it's some kind of a process, even taking the mindset into our heads as well. So we have to move somewhere and sometimes it's happening quite fast. So then there is a question how to keep this focus on cu customers during these digital transformations. And that's why I'm inviting uh, Mr. Martin uh, Verzinc, head of e-business division in joint stock company Citadella Banca. Welcome. and uh, probably some of the ideas I'm going to share with you will be more from practical perspective rather than from the academical. And I think it is really very important uh, that when we talk about this digital transformation, and I think uh, Christophs uh, very well mentioned those cases when actually some of the companies or even these governmental institutions are saying that there happened a digital transformation but uh, actually there are no change of the process and we are talking about the same old process and all those cases I'm all uh, like uh, putting a digital lipstick on analog pig and those are certainly not the cases I'm going to describe here. So um, when we talk about the digital transformations and uh, for, the cus uh, for, for the customers and how customers are actually using things, um, very often we kind of believe that only technology is responsible for success for the all things what we do um, while innovating. And frankly speaking, if you are looking at uh, Tesla factory, which is this picture, where are only r the robots and uh, no humans at all, it makes sense because everything what you are producing or all the processes which are happening, they are happening on the machine speed and not at the human speed. So there is significant difference. And uh, this has been the true for uh, the last, uh, I would say, seven, eight hundred years because the technology and the use of technology have been driving the success of uh, certain businesses. But now, lately, uh, when we talk about the innovations, we really need to uh, not forget that the customer behavior uh, has really dramatically changed. And when we are looking at the customers, it is actually like need of breaking some of the existing habits for those people and uh, also requirement that the service which you have created or the product you have created brings a, this value for the customer and uh, you are also uh, feeling the emotionally that there is the value for you and when we uh, also uh, did the research in the Baltics what for example is one of the key factors for the people using the innovation or not one of the uh, most uh, common uh, answers was that innovation will be used in case it saves me time for certain things. And this is part of also what we in Citadel are really focusing on, how to save time for certain things in the processes. So this picture also very clearly demonstrates that uh, some of the things from the technological, technological perspective already exist on the markets and uh, maybe they are not that oftenly used and it actually took quite many years in uh, supermarkets that the longest queues are currently at the self-service points rather than at the cashier points. So it takes time and uh, when we uh, talk about the innovations, and um, in the next slide I will have a little bit deeper look at the Kodak case. Um, but we need to also understand that uh, sometimes when we look and we see that 
customer uh, behavior is not changing that rapidly, this might uh, also create a misleading feel for the management of the companies that there is no need to switch or there is no need to change because uh, people are not going to use these things. So, and this was uh, like an um, approach for quite many companies which now are used as examples in business books, like BlackBerry, who said that, okay, people are going to continue to use keyboards uh, on the mobile phones because this is what the business needs. And within uh, 10 years, they are out of the business. Um, Kodak, who said that, digital photo photography is not something what most of the people will use. They will still use the films because the quality is going to be much better. And the blockbuster videos, uh, there was a chain in the US which was sending out uh, the DVDs and uh, who at certain point had uh, actually uh, business negotiations with uh, Netflix and could actually go with the Netflix, but decided no, this uh, DVD business is much more sustainable. But customer behavior and everything that happens in the world is changing. So some of those decisions might really hurt. And if you are looking at the uh, Kodak, I think um, this is really very, very classical uh, story. And uh, what actually ran, went wrong? I think uh, it is actually pity to learn and to know that uh, actually this innovation itself, the digital camera invention, happened in Kodak itself. And uh, that uh, for a very long time, they were actually getting a lot of uh, business for selling a patent. And only after a very, very long time, they decided to go with the digital cameras, but still decided not really fully switch to the digital. Because still, like I said, this quality on uh, uh, these film machines was bringing them more business value. But the paradigm was already shifting and people were already starting to use the digital more. They were starting to share the photos and we know how all this thing grew. And even like 20 years ago when they still had the chance to maybe slightly move and grab some share of the digital, with um, this acquisition of all photo, they still decided to use it for photo printing rather than sharing the photos and growing this digital business. And we all know how it ended. So now Kodak is much more smaller company, which still creates a lot of chemicals and a lot of uh, films for a very certain customer group, but they are not serving the whole customer. So basically, this uh, uh, story ended and the customers started already to use totally different uh, products. And uh, this, this slide is really something what we inside the organization are doing. And Kasper, so, uh, sorry, Christoph uh, mentioned that there is this uh, idea of changing from these development models from waterfall to agile. And this is exactly what Citadel does in, in, inside the, the organization itself. So if you are looking at the existing business models, uh, so usually the business people are coming up with ideas of the product. And then they give like very strict instructions what needs to be done. And then the development team starts to create the product, delivers the product. And only then the marketing people are starting to work on the product, uh, starting creating the value proposition and trying to sell the product. And of course, there are the situations and cases when this strategy is OK and still you can sell the product. However, if uh, we are going totally different approach, we are starting from the customer and we are actually creating the prototype and saying, OK, we are having an idea. Or here is a totally new technology, how you would use it. And you get the feedback, you get the value, and then you decide how or what has been found in those researches, what actually triggered inside those potential customers of yours, uh, 
and only then you create the product strategy, then you are creating totally different strategy experience or customer experience for these customers and uh, then developing this solution is something what the customers expect and you are actually getting totally different feedback from the customers and uh, the usage of those products are much much more higher so this maybe is not just uh, like the old approach in quite many cases this is actually also what the startups are doing there are some startups some people who are saying no I have this vision I have this strategy but unfortunately people are not doing these researches and uh, what we have found out that actually the right approach is that you do the first iteration you create the so-called MVP or minimal viable product for your solution for service or product and only then when you are trying with the final test group you decide what still you could do what still you could improve so basically this is like a cycle you are turning back and uh, while uh, doing the measurement and doing those iterations and this is the way how you can actually get much much more value from these things so also to give like a famous person's opinion so Steve Jobs also has mentioned that uh, you need to start with the customer experience and then technology is something how you will decide which technology or which ways you can use because this is like really giving this uh, totally different experience for the customers and also stickiness to that product and uh, also uh, service so over the weekend I was actually also reading some articles and I came up on really really very interesting um, recent research and uh, one of the things I was looking for was that how customers are looking at the innovation itself and it was really uh, very interesting for me as a technology person who thought that innovation is something people are always looking for actually see that innovation across all the generations never has been like the top thing and there is a lot of uh, things changing in those graphs but and, 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 and we see that this differentiation and also you know, integrity of the companies as well as authenticity is something customers are looking forward so those are these emotional things and this is where this experience becomes really really very crucial so not that we, we don't care as uh, users about the technology which is used but uh, we are looking uh, how we are going to achieve most of the experience so uh, when we talk about the let's say customer experience still you would like to know how we are as a company uh, as a bank um, working and clearly we are selecting some of these behaviors or technologies and we are continuously testing them and uh, I would like to share with you some of these ideas how this next transactional world should look like and it's clearly like with uh, previous examples about the Uber um, this could be also like financial or insurance related tasks all the transactions we expect to see invisible secure in real time and uh, what is the most important enriching these positive experiences so we are really capable of uh, differentiating and creating a lot of different digital products but these are like the drivers we should keep in mind when we want to create something new and um, second thing which is clearly the area where we as a bank as a financial institution are working are the usage of uh, the different uh, remote identification methods and uh, we have been the uh, first bank in uh, Baltics who introduced the digital onboarding we are the mobile banking application this we did 
uh, last year, and we are continuously uh, looking how many of the things could be done more with biometrics. And you see on the list also the voice. So clearly this is one of really, really huge areas. We are going to do a lot more with digital assistants. Again, less with the screens, but talking with our digital assistants and uh, uh, even our behavior can make uh, the recognition of us and uh, provide information about um, our identity. Plus different IoT sensors, what I mean here is like uh, digital wearables. I'm also having the smartwatch, uh, which, which currently is not probably shared with my insurer, the data, but uh, still, if these data sets are also included, we can get a lot more very interesting data sets which could be used. So digital onboarding I mentioned, and why I wanted to also to bring it here as a separate slide. I really believe that digital onboarding is not just something which is applicable only for financial sector. This is basically something which becomes very, very relevant for any industry. So we are going to be more digital. There is going to be our digital identity. And some of those uh, data sets is certainly will be very, very important uh, for the future future businesses. We are not going to visit uh, some branches or, or um, let's say, uh, service centers. I think that more and more digital transactions are going to happen with us in the next uh, 10, 20 years. So uh, just uh, when uh, maybe to summarize, and, and when we are looking at us as a bank, we very clearly two years ago defined that we want to be the best bank in your pocket. And all these developments uh, and all these customer approaches which I have shared with you were the ones which you, we used in our strategy to kind of grow. And uh, today also when we introduced the Apple Pay, this was like continuous improvement on different payment methods what you can do with um, uh, Citadel uh, mobile banking application or Citadel mobile devices. So like payments with a HCE, now we are working with payment rings, we are having bracelet stickers. So all these things are like wearables which are somehow around our digital um, environment. And just some takeaways uh, for you, um, and also from this quick story I shared, um, I think it's really important to think about the customer, to think about the audience who are the customers of yours, and know exactly what their needs are. And diversifying these experiences are allowing uh, all the organizations to reach really different and uh, different customer groups and grow the business uh, this, uh, this way. And uh, also remembering the Kodak story, innovate not just for today, but really think like five to 10 years uh, ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And actually, I will invite you directly to this like expert dis discussion area as uh, you will be one of the participants as well. We will start expert discussion on the topic transformation as the strategic task in the digital age, especially for the financial sector. So uh, along with Martin, uh, I invite as well Kristaps, which you met today as well from Accenture Latvia. Then uh, Ilya Arefejaus from BA School of Business and Finance and Arnis Sauka from Stockholm School of Economics in Riga. So welcome. Find your name tags, turn them <laughs> on the other side, and then we can start. And then we have some technology to use to get some questions answered as well. So actually, as I feel that you are very broad, there's broad expertise, and you can answer actually on every question that is like uh, planned on uh, my, my schedule, then uh, I will start with like a first one. So thinking about this, like there, there is, has been this like a slogan, digitalize, digitize or die. 
actually. And uh, sometimes that's feeling that it's sometimes too often used. And then there is, would be a question to all of you. So how do you feel? Is there this ability continuously to update your information, IT part and communication technologies? And is it already like a norm, like a prerequisite for the company to be a competitive in the service area and especially in this like a uh, financial uh, industry as well. So Bray one can start the first one. So is, is, is there a feeling already that this is like a need in order to survive, let's say so? I, I would compare that with uh, also with us as individuals. It's uh, about the life, lifetime learning. Like if you continuously keep learning, you also uh, it's science says, yeah, you stay uh, more younger also in, in, in heart, in face, and also by age, right? The same is with the companies. If you have that, this uh, innovation DNA embedded, and you continuously work in different layers uh, about that, as I also mentioned about, uh, as well about the aging diversity, so you think also forward not how you will uh, release the new tech, but also how you will upgrade, let's say, the people who are not maybe so fluent with that. So I would say it, it really comes from the strategic uh, level. And uh, if that is, uh, as, as also you shared, if that the mindset is, is at least five years term, at least, right, then I, I think it's, it naturally will come, right? If it's a just a one year's uh, perspective about the return of investment, I think it, it will not, not gonna fly. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Martin. So uh, I actually think that uh, all, um, if we are looking at uh, the customers, and again, continuously uh, conti uh, continuing uh, this um, vision, it is important to understand who are our customers. Because if, uh, if, if, if we are like good and we are serving a certain uh, customer group, then it might be that we don't actually need to increase something or in, uh, in, in uh, make something more complex because when we were looking at the technology, bringing up different technologies, sometimes it also brings the complexity. And also when we are looking uh, at the uh, usage of certain things, um, it is kind of necessary to understand are the people ready for these changes. So. It, it really requires to find the right balance. And uh, again, this is important when you are planning uh, your business for longer time period. And I totally agree with Christophs that uh, uh, for, for certain things, it may be there is no need to digitalize. And uh, some of the technologies or some of the things might just disappear anyway so will disappear some of these particular businesses. If you are looking for totally new ones, then those clearly are the digital ones, and you should be investing and looking how you are going to address these new markets and new customers. Mm -hmm. What's the view from academic side? <laughs> and uh, Arne, so. Well, you will never hear that in the very exact answer from the academic side ever, <laughs> of course. But I, I think I, I, what, what I really liked uh, from both uh, uh, keynotes uh, earlier today is that uh, maybe, maybe the central issue is not really a digitalization. The central issue could be convenience and effectiveness. And, uh, and from that perspective, uh, I don't think anybody will die because of not uh, being digital enough. But, uh, but it might hurt many people to be effective and, and their lives might be very hard if they do not use the digital tools. Uh, not always it is a sort of a, a case uh, that it is sort of the, the positive case in the terms that I remember back in 2001 or two, I worked for a company and uh, we had a lot of uh, communication with, uh, with abroad uh, and, and the or, our owners noticed that we pay too much money for the, for the phone bills. And, and our company came with invention. I don't, I, I don't remember whether it was a Skype or something else, but, but, but they, they bought us uh, air muffs and you know, these uh, things. And, and, and we, were, we were told that we, from, from this day, we should call our foreign kind of uh, wh whoever they are, suppliers or, or customers, only by using those things. And uh, it turned out that it's, it's just too difficult. The, uh, the, the, the it, it was the, it, it was not there. It was too long. It was very, very 
bad noise and, and we, we started to lose customers because of, of this of this bad communication. Mm -hmm. And then and then they understood okay, well, you know, it's it's not a good idea, so okay, we, we forget about this. And and then they reinvented this technology when the technology was ready again like in, in five years. So it turned out that it was not that convenient to use this sort of digital uh, technology. Same mm -hmm. thing if we buy a new phone that looks very nice and costs a lot of money, but uh, you know it just it just doesn't function. And and I've I've had it myself with my with, with a couple of times going and talking uh, to, to those you know people who are responsible and asking them why why does this thing does not work and they said well you know, it's a new technology it, it has these baby problems and okay well I bought this phone paying a lot of money so why should I experience all those baby problems so so that does not make my life convenient mm. and and then of course I give up this this intention yet uh, if I would if I would do and and many of us if we would go to, I don't know, to the banks to pay our monthly bills. These days, th that would be torturing <laughs> ourselves, I guess, in many cases, exactly. right? Because we can do it very easily <laughs> with, with, the, with, with, with what the... Automatic Online bank. banking, instance, right? Automatic <coughs> banking yeah. and, and so, so many of us would have like lots of examples when, when using digital uh, is, uh, is convenient and efficient. And sometimes when it's, when it's not. And, and if, it's, if it's convenient, I think, uh, well, these days, I think also people buy more uh, in a, we, we go maybe less to the shops and we use uh, more these e-services to, to buy grocery products. Mm. I mean, in, in our family, we do this as well. And actually, it's cheaper, it's more efficient because then you can scroll down the things. You don't have uh, your, your sons or, or, or daughters asking you to buy all those, you know, bad things, mm. which you usually do buy anyway, the candies and then chips and crisps and so on. So, so it's, 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 it's also more effecti effective and more convenient uh, way, I think, of planning. So that, that would be a long academic answer, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, William, uh, comments? Yes, yeah, so uh, actually I'm very thankful to Christophs for bringing this term screenagers. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, I'm afraid it can be the whole business segment nowadays <laughs> with no age limitations. Uh, but yeah. but uh, I would like to bring two examples in relation to a digitalization. Uh, in the EU Commission corridors, some fancy things uh, tend to circulate around, and one of the fancy things is so-called a digital tax. Uh, so the digital tax agenda got a very high priority, so it got even to the OECD, and the agreement is that the, the, such a tax should be developed by the end of this year, so this is a pretty ambitious deadline, and just the straightforward logic is that if somebody is going to tax something, then perhaps we're talking about a uh, super fast growing marketplace, which is already quite big. Now, this is my first takeaway. Uh, the second uh, little example is about, it's this kind of a mini case study. Uh, France already introduced uh, almost a digital tax. They labeled this, uh, it as a digital service tax. This is an interim measure before this digital tax is introduced. Uh, but, you know, it was not really implemented, enabled, because it was heavily opposed, guess by whom? Uh, and the, the argument was that if somebody is going to take an advantage of U.S. companies, that's going to be U.S. itself, and that gives uh, us another takeaway. Uh, th so the first takeaway is that the digitalization is happening <laughs> in a very uh, fast pace already, and it's a huge marketplace. Uh, if we are not there, then we are missing the train or we are behind the curve. The second takeaway is that how does Europe look in these terms if there is already um, kind of a uh, pre-assumption that if a uh, digital tax is introduced, then most likely this is going to be U.S. businesses text. Mm -hmm. So I hear that <coughs> definitely this customer value should be the, the primary thing, the need uh, there, and then you can build up. But most probably it's not like that that we can forget about the digitization because like some competition is coming from the Europe, from US, from the China, and so on. So probably we, we have to, right? So if you would have to say yes or no, can we forget about the digitization? So only one word. So those who say no. Raise your hands. So we, we shouldn't we shouldn't digitize. We shouldn't digitize, and we should digitize still. And so everybody <laughs> kind of agrees that we should move forward. Yeah, then I, I like this point. maybe sorry. Switch on. Maybe. I think we as a Europe definitely need to kind of unite some strategy because these big guys, of course, they change these four, five uh, mags or how, whatever the name is now. 
but this is definitely something we need to look to, right? Because this uh, big tech companies, they, I know they're having a different taxation, uh, so there is a, a lot of uh, incentives for them to even grow faster the business, right? And the Europe can uh, be just uh, consumers of that, right? Do we want to be just the consumers? Yeah. Or we want to be a builders? Mm -hmm. So you a bit touched in your keynote about this like uh, intelligent part of like uh, di digitization in general. So this intelligence comes for like taking more into account this like customer perspective or it's more like knowing where to go and which technology to take. So how do you feel on that side? So it's like we are not enough leveraging the thing that we know about the customer side, not using or so. I, I think it's, uh, it's a mix. So definitely there should be uh, consumer cent cent centric and, and that's, that's, that's the one thing. But uh, if we look at this macro scope of the big, uh, big business and there of course there is some um, political layer, then there is some uh, layer, uh, if you look also, probably you have better uh, facts, but uh, once some year back when I looked uh, around the pie where the biggest patents come, also Europe is not winning, definitely, right? So it's the States, it's uh, in India, Europe is actually, again, behind, right? So, so it is from different angles, right? So I, I would say we are pretty good at uh, uh, user-centric or defining the values. Uh, we just haven't learned how to scale it up, uh, at least in Europe level, and then to compete on the world level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe Martin, a quick comment on this. Like you mentioned that it took two years in order like to teach something for the customers. And I fully agree that some for customer, it's much easier like to change the product rather than to change the behavior as well. So how do you feel about this? Like how financial sector is the in a position where they kind of push some kind of solutions towards customer versus like wait for this like maturity of some specific technology when customer is coming and saying that you mentioned that I have an ap Apple, I want to pay with that one. So is, where is this, this like a balance? So uh, I think that uh, this is exactly something uh, where you are all the time measuring and trying to understand uh, uh, what is the right uh, time to proceed with certain technologies. And um, how I see that is uh, that uh, in, in, in my team, we are having like backlog of different ideas. Mm -hmm. And what we all the time do, we are measuring um, the customer feedback and also the readiness. So we are launching some of the features. We are launching uh, some of the new directions. For example, I mentioned this uh, uh, audio or voice and voice recognition. We have launched also like one small feature, uh, which is Siri shortcuts on a phone. So you can create already like uh, first way how you can execute some of the payments saying to your voice assistant, hey Siri, please do this or that. And the payment is done, you don't need to pick up your phone. And guess what? We are looking at the usage. We are mm -hmm. seeing how many users are interested in these direction, in these things. And then if we are like developing a lot of uh, other, other uh, new features or technologies, we are introducing them, but we are not like maybe delivering them 100%. Or like uh, if you would imagine how this new product should look like, like in, in four or five years, we are not trying to build the whole product or put all our effort on this. But having this agile approach, we are really like creating the MVP, which makes sense, and then we test, and then we see, and this allows us not to spend that much resources and time on one particular direction, but grow rapidly and respond rapidly where we see what uh, customers are looking for and what they are using. So I think that it is really important that we are not just building something and not measuring the usage, but it is really crucial nowadays to see the feedback from not just usage perspective, but also from the customer satisfaction and uh, continue to ask customers what would be the things you still would see to be improved in this particular area. And if they are not having the answers, then you wait with that technology. Mm -hmm. 
Then that would be a question for the academic sector. So maybe linking together with this discussion what we have in the morning regarding green uh, transformation. So do you see that there is like a clear uh, direction that this tra transformation also could be like a great enabler actually for helping like to transform as well like digitally as like probably talking about circular economy like reusing some parts like uh, into like um, again like and again 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 less waste more like digital parts so do you see that there is like a, some kind of clear relations to that and how, how this can help like to enable the digital transformation as well? Well I, I have no <laughs> idea really. Uh, what, I, what I think I know is that uh, that we should probably distinguish between uh, different types of customers right? Probably as, as, as you do in, in banks and, and other institutions as well. And, uh, and, and one type of customer would be those that are obsessed in a, in a good way with uh, er anything that is green because it's, it's a modern, it's, it's stylish, it's, you know, it's sexy, it's cool. So they would do anything about this and they would, uh, they would chase the banks asking for uh, lower rates, right? Like our good friends uh, Martin does and uh, very, very nice experience, I think, and uh, an example of that. And, and then we will also probably have customers who are really obsessed, again, in a good way, in good meaning of this word with uh, anything that, that is digital. For instance, if, uh, if banks such as uh, Citadel introduces the, the, the band that allows you to pay, Interesting. right? Then uh, I know some of my friends who switched banks because of that. And, and they, they have all the digital you know, things in, in, their, in their houses. I have no idea what, what, what they do. I hope they, they have idea themselves. But so they, they buy them, they use them, they, they, they experience, they, they try, they, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, 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 that is, and that is what one type of the customer. Mm -hmm. But I think you will also agree that in, in most cases, uh, people are not like that. I, I'm not like that for, for, for sure. And, and I, I remember from, from those times when I was, uh, uh, in a in a in a entrepreneurship in a sort of but also we see it from the research, and and I think all of you who have done some sort of sales in your lives would, would agree to me that uh, that in general customers stick to the to the things that are that they are comfortable with. Yeah, actually, Safe, yeah, comfortable. Martin showed the graph, so exactly, they're not expecting right? innovation. As a and person. sometimes sometimes they and they don't give up those things that easily, even though. Sometimes they might overpay. Sometimes it might not be that convenient. But, but for instance, if, if as a salesperson you establish a great contact, so you're convenient to that, so the, the, the customer is convenient with your service, you can charge a bit more, you can, you know, you, you can do more things than, than others could do. And, mm -hmm. and, and that customer will, uh, will, uh, might go to another salesperson if you, for instance, are not available, or if you are sick for some time, or if you, if you overcharge too much, so, so something should happen, right? And, and, and good salesperson will make sure that this something will not happen. And you can, you know, you can, you can live with, with this customer forever, right? The, the, the pressure of this digitalization and, and the green uh, is something that, that might change habits of the customer. But then really something should happen Mm -hmm. within the, the, the attitudes or within the, the behavior of, of experiences of that customer that, that really makes this customer to make this step. Otherwise, they would, most of the, most if, I mean, as, as far as I can generalize, but most of the people I would, I would say would stick to their older habits. That means that they will not that much as, as some of digital people would, would like them to use those digital uh, tools. They might use them less than, than from, from that perspective. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the sales perspective, perhaps. Yeah. Thanks, Ilya. Something yes, I'll try to also to add to this uh, academic answer. So if, if, the if the general question is whether a uh, digitalization or digital economy can contribute to the green economy, yes, uh, true. Uh, what I'm afraid of is that this uh, contribution can be incremental, not a disruptive one. Uh, we see very good examples nowadays. For example, when you buy a plane ticket, afterwards you see that, for example, there can be a question to you as a buyer, would you like to be CO emission neutral and compensate, let's say, whatever, mm -hmm. five euros or seven euros for the emissions uh, which are going to be uh, left in the nature because of the plane, and then you can donate, and then you're kind of 
uh, fighting this climate change. And this is, this is all enabled because of uh, digital things, digital developments. You can make a lot of uh, uh, better things in other areas as well. But if the question is whether we can achieve a climate change targets by going just digital, I would say certainly no, it, it, it's not sufficient because then we have to look very seriously into the energy sector and the heavy manufacturing, things like that. And in order to answer the question, to what extent uh, digitalization might help to achieve uh, climate change targets, you need to have really, really very detailed mm -hmm. uh, research on that. Mm -hmm. So it's, if it's like more like a service sector, then you would feel more comfortable rather it's like a manufacturing and like producing goods and that part, right? So I, I'm quite confident that if we are going more digital, we're bringing very positive incremental effects to the economy, but by, by making economy greener, so to say, mm -hmm. Uh, but if we want, if we need to, we need to take much more radical moves to achieve the climate change targets, and then just going digital is not sufficient there. Mm -hmm. Thank you for uh, your answers, like on this like unexpected turn of this discussion and this like linking with like green transformation as well. So then uh, another part uh, which we would love to discuss is that not only are the sectors and industries like changing in this like a digital process but also the awareness of it like understanding what we understand with digital transformation and and uh, the concepts and, and of identifying changes dictated by this digitization and probably there are some nuances and i will probably start with like uh, academic sector maybe from the research perspective so how these changes are like perceived if we think about in the companies level organizations and how they are used in strategy if we use those concepts like digital strategy, digital transformation, digital maturity. So is this one and the same thing? Is there like uh, only digital transformation and there are like several meanings of that? So maybe you can elaborate. So is there something to look for and can we lose ourselves by, by just talking about those things and telling them? Okay. Perhaps I will start since the microphone is the closest to yes, me. Is uh, Yes, I think th th the key point here, which was already actually uh, discussed today, that uh, in the core, in the center, we should place a customer uh, or certain customer groups uh, because we are doing this for customers. And there was a very nice term uh, mentioned today, screenagers. Yeah, so perhaps this is uh, the, the, the most, uh, the, the easiest group to deal with in a sense that they will be the most open to these digital changes and it's very easy to implement the digital strat uh, strategy if you have just this customer group, uh, so most likely they'll be, we can, we can call them so-called a early adopter, uh, early uh, adopters of uh, new technologies. Uh, now, the point is that no, not all customers are so-called screenagers or that open to new technologies. And then up to uh, their willingness to adopt new technologies will be the overall success story, whether we will succeed in our digitalization or, or fail. And then again, we have to be uh, very specific what we are talking about, how fast we do this digitalization, etc. Because even if we take Latvia as an example, we have uh, big companies which are operating on the whole territory of Latvia. Mm -hmm. And you know, Latvia has a very concentrated population. So Riga and Riga's district uh, make roughly uh, half of or even more of a Latvia's population. And I would assume that it's much easier to pursue the digitalization uh, strategy there and also in some other big cities and towns. Uh, now, of course, uh, you, you, when we go further, uh, perhaps adoption, new technology adoption rates uh, might fall and then uh, companies might encounter difficulties uh, to change uh, customer behavior. And this is again very much up to a specific company because those companies uh, who operate in a very populated areas in some, in, in some sense might have some advantage mm -hmm. because it's easier to target their uh, customer segments and easier to propose certain solutions. Those, custom, uh, those companies who are serving really um, the whole Latvian population have to deal with this uh, diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that sense, yes, this is the way to go, but the question is about the pace and the question is that whether it's really, uh, the, the, the primary purpose is to do it for customers. And of course, if a company has a really uh, diversity in its customer base, two different customer segments, then uh, the digitalization strategy will be much more difficult to pursue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, this is, this is very good, but also I think very, very broad 
question, if I if I may say so. It, it really depends on the business, I guess, we, we are talking about here. If, uh, if for instance, uh, somebody is in the business of, of car production or production of the phones, then, I mean, of course, you have to always be with the with the rays of the technology. Otherwise, uh, you you can have Nokia or or uh, or, or Kodak type of, of, of problems, right? <laughs> uh, if you are in a in a business as usual that is considering to move into the digital, then uh, then that's another story. If you are in a, if you're in finance sector and you are not considering uh, digitalization at all then you are in a bigger problem than the Nokia, I think, was at some point, right? We, we were recently in, in New York and, and, uh, and, and somebody told me that the New York, uh, the Nasdaq is going to be a museum soon because uh, most mm. of, the, of what is happening uh, there happens digital via computers. So we don't need any, any building anymore, right? And uh, so it, it, uh, it, it, it really depends. Uh, uh, Talking about uh, digitalization strategy as such, uh, well, it's uh, I think it's it's just way too broad. Yeah. So, uh, how do you feel that these like words and like uh, yeah, terminology has like misused in some of the contexts? Uh, or well like they, they are they, they are nice they are nice <laughs> keywords if you apply for EU project, for instance, right? Mm. <laughs> then, then 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 it's fine. Or, or if you want to catch attention of, of, of students, if you are a business school, then could be could be good. But, uh, but then really, what is the essence? So what is when when are you mm -hmm. using this? And I try to I try to elaborate with some examples that yeah. uh, that in some cases, uh, well, digitalization strategy can mean different things. Uh, also, digitalization strategy for the for the government uh, mm -hmm. or, or, or governments in general, uh, public administration is uh, is is something. Mm -hmm. It's it's maybe depends on which stage you are. Depends where you are going. Mm -hmm. Perhaps. Okay. So, uh, I would say that um, it's actually there are no st very strict definitions for uh, digitalization. There are no very strict um, definitions for digital maturity. So everyone is having totally different uh, understanding and also if you are looking at the different countries again those definitions def the definitions are totally different right um, I, I really like the idea uh, that uh, when we are looking uh, in case of Latvia in Riga and uh, suburbs around Riga that this digitalization could be totally different comparing the other mm -hmm. countryside but uh, I think that what countryside needs to think more is slightly different uh, term, and this is automation. And uh, when we talk about the digitalization and automation, there is maybe different industries or different types of the produc productions uh, or, or, or and, and uh, different industries, but this is the something which still will develop and if we are just uh, relying on um, manual work, this is going to disappear. But this automation is not exactly digitalization. So if we are talking about farming, if we are talking about this sustainability and other things, we are going to use our resources smarter. But we cannot call this digitalization because digitalization is something that lives kind of virtually which we are consuming as a service, but when we are talking about the product, then we could say that we are going to manufacture some of these things in a smarter way. And the automation is going to help and some of the processes will be more digital. And but, but still, a lot of manual work might be in, in some of these things. But uh, I think that we need to find this balance and understanding that uh, some industries are not going to change. And just to take an example, uh, the restaurant business. Uh, yes, <laughs> maybe in fast food stores, um, you, you might expect and see, and I have been on exhibitions where the robots were preparing the food, but that was like really one of the things. But uh, my oldest son, he is uh, uh, working in restaurant business, and he's a chef, and he works in, at a Michelin restaurant. And that's totally something different. That's the form of the art, 
and the people are going and looking at uh, how those people are working. And there is some of the automation happening, mm -hmm. and digital is something which lives as a marketing product or marketing things because people are consuming more of these digital things. But still, you are going to consume something which is going to be purely manual work. Mm -hmm. Christo, see you, for example, you have seen the world probably more often as like Accenture is like operating yeah. worldwide. So have you seen those different those meeting, the meanings of this digitization and digital transformation usage? Yeah, yeah. so two, two quick answers. <coughs> One is uh, I strongly believe that any business uh, who at least wants to be a, at least some, some type big will have uh, this layer of digitalization, but uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, it not always will be this kind of, for, for us as a basic user, this front end. It's more actually will happen on a, on a back end, on a automation, on this optimization. So as again, uh, 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 totally share uh, your point about the, the Michelin experience. It should be about this personal experience, but how you book the visit, how you review the visit, so that's definitely will be digitalized, right? So. Uh, if at one point, uh, at one point, Instagram will launch immediate, let's say, restaurant booking you by just swiping it, I believe everybody will start to use it, right? So it is about digitalization, but not always it will be visible, right? So while using uh, Bolt and not paying by money, it is a seamless experience which happens some, somewhere in a cloud, right? Mm -hmm. So the same is also a bit coming back to your previous question about this, is there a correlation between the green uh, again, I it is in a way if you can optimize a lot of the, for example, I don't know, about the smart mobility, right? If, if there would be a clear business, case, clear business case about the smart parking, so you directly can see where you can book a car, place a car, so you will optimize the time you spend just uh, circulating in, uh, around the city, so it definitely will reduce uh, pollution rate, right? So there is clear uh, correlation between that. Or if you uh, optimize some, I don't know, SAP systems uh, for the ports, how the uh, ships stay in the, uh, this, uh, well, how you say it, uh, while waiting then can come in into the ports, they're keeping just uh, engines running, right? And if you can optimize, because a lot of the waiting time is actually because of the doc documentation processing, right? Again, you can optimize that with uh, different type of uh, things. And uh, you, by that, you will optimize uh, also this uh, efficiency, right? So I would say all businesses uh, are and will have this digital agenda, but in different uh, speed and, and uh, form. Uh, but definitely, this will be. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not always on the front end, but more on the a, on a, on a back end side. Yeah. And about this maturity, I totally agree. It's, it's very much about about the benchmark where you measure. So what is as is position and where you want to be, right? So we are not equal, on that term, we are not equal, right? Mm -hmm. And another thing is about this fake digitalization, what we touched. I li like this term, digital list lipstick, you said, yeah? Digital yeah. lipstick. Yeah, on an Olympic, yeah. Or, or the, the example I mentioned about doing a digital by just scanning papers, right? And making this, potentially this EU digital tag, right? Is it digital? I don't think so, right? Mm -hmm. do, do you see some, uh, like, on strategic level, some, uh, some of those, like, uh, meanings, which play more, like, a uh, role? Is it, like, this automation part? So is it, like, this, like, a foresight looking five years into ahead, this, like, using the, that part of, like, looking into digitization? So from strategic perspective, so how, which is, like, the best way, how the most actually thinking from the business perspective, so where you can get more money, so the best way to go when you think about digitization is start small with the customer side or like look in the future or? I think it's, it's uh, the same, uh, as you also mentioned, it's the same, I think, approach also. Amazon uses, so it's a backwards thinking, right? You, you need to understand where you want to be, what value you would, you would like to get, and then you kind of just uh, draw it back mm -hmm. with the timeline, with the resources, with the, uh, with uh, research needed to be conducted, right? And uh, then you start to build it up, right? So, uh, yeah, so I think it should be value-based, right? It shouldn't be just a process-based, uh, digital in sake mm -hmm. of a digital, so let's, let's do a good PR. No, it, you, you should reach some, some value, what you want to look like, right? And this is also 
what is Agile talking, right? You should be flexible pivoting during this roadmap once you're leading to this value. Mm -hmm. And again, this a bit correlates with, uh, with this legacy in the different policies, governmental structures, and et cetera. So uh, there is a lot of roadblockers currently for this flexibility. Mm -hmm. Anyone can comment on like, like, have you seen those road blockers on the like a public sector? So which are the biggest like obstacles there? So th while this, wh wh when this digitization can happen, and maybe why it's not happening if you see that it should happen? Yeah. Actually, before this uh, session, we were discussing with uh, Christophs, and um, I think that uh, the main blocker that we are having, or let's say this barrier, is in a Europe that we are trying to use or create uh, in each country particular solutions and not agreeing that something could be used in a wider area. And very good example is uh, uh, when we talk about the finance sector uh, that uh, each of the regulators in each of the countries are creating their own rules, not being capable of uh, agreeing like on pan baltical rules or there is like the um, EBA standards and we are still trying to kind of create the local legislation for each of those small things. Or uh, even if we are creating like tools which are already used and maybe used in two Baltic countries, still one of the Baltic country will decide to create their own um, solution. So we, are, we, 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 are, we, we need to think more as a, uh, let's say, European uh, nations that we need to have like common strategy and we need to execute these common strategies because this is where this uh, global economy is going and there will be from the customer perspective just few platforms or just few usage patterns how you want to deal with certain things. And if you are from this legal or legislation perspective creating these uh, very, uh, even maybe there are small, small barriers, but still if you cannot create like one product or one service available for wider markets, this uh, is the showstopper. Mm -hmm. Have any thoughts on the here? If, if you kind of answered already this part of the question. So yeah, <laughs> yes, I, I absolutely agree. And I also remember a chart from the screen. I think it was called a uh, trapped value. What's the difference between traditional business and a technological business? So we seem to be in this trapped value. Uh, our value seem to be, seems to be trapped in Europe because of the scattered and dispersed uh, regulations. Now, if you look at success stories of these uh, big tech companies, what they do, they clearly offer the same product everywhere, but they do a fair degree of localization. So at least they offer this product in a big variety of languages, but otherwise, you know, they're offering the same product everywhere, the same service. So they, they, their, their businesses are purely scalable and uh, localized to the extent needed, and uh, this might be the reason why they have, if not billions, then hundreds of millions of users or screenagers. As they call them, so generally agree. And so paying fines is part of the business case. Yes. Yeah. And <laughs> paying uh, fines for <laughs> legislation is part Planned, of the business budgeted case. Budgeted and, and, yeah. and so on. So Ilya, you start about this, like uh, showing or talking about this, like digitization on scale, or like some companies which are creating products in the scale. So, is this the future, like for this, like a financial or sector, like or like a service sector in general? So where we can like develop those information and uh, techno technological parts so using this like a global say. Is this the future? Now, if you talk general about the uh, digitization, then of course having a, a scalable model, scalable business model or scalable solution is a clearly a precondition. Mm -hmm. uh, if you talk specifically about the, the, the financial sector, uh, then of course there, there is again a variety of opinions. Uh, my personal preference is for an opinion which basically is uh, very clearly stating that uh, big tech companies uh, at, at one point of time will be still offering uh, daily financial services. Uh, traditional banks will stay, but their, their share, their, their importance will drop. 
uh, there will be uh, some uh, financial technology companies which are not big techs because big techs I guess uh, we all know what I'm talking about this is companies like Facebook Google and like that um, and of course there will be still a lot of niche banks because uh, yeah, uh, there are specific customer segments uh, typically these are business customers uh, who need very tailored services and these customers will be served by, 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 by uh, so-called niche banks but uh, Generally, uh, I think we might see very soon that daily banking services or daily financial services are provided by big tech rather than by, by traditional banks, at least by, uh, not, not by banks who will not innovate enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So comment on uh, maybe even on Arnis' uh, side, first about this like a scale or like where, where the future is and I'm uh, thinking that uh, you all have like investigated as well this like a shadow economy and so how, how do you feel that is there direction where this like digitization for the financial industry can bring some benefit if there is a more digital real-time data and transparency in place so maybe you from that angle as well. Oh, you, uh, <laughs> you, you asked a question that is very close to my heart. I can yes, talk a uh, long yes, time for uh, about this. I tried uh, my best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, of course, whatever is is digital, uh, it is at least until now, and it, it is also changing because of the security measures introduced and so on and so forth. But, but, but in general, I mean, if 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 it's digital, it's it's harder to to track. Uh, it used to be at least like mm -hmm. like like this. Uh, for this reason, uh, I don't know the the video or or music that is does it, that this digital is is very much uh, uh, in shadows, if if not in the in the black market, because it's very very hard to 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 find those 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 people who who are dealing with this. And of course, the, the there's lots of uh, lots of security issues. If if we move to the digital world, if if we do business in the digital world, uh, then uh, then a uh, lot, of, and, and, and also if the finance moves to the to the digital, I will not talk about the cryptocurrencies here, but uh, but 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 still, even even if 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 kind of the 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 no normal as we understand at least today, if if that part of the finance moves to the digital world more and more, then of course there are there are many security kind of issues associated with that, and uh, and it is actually no surprise, and business is thinking about that. We see this, for instance, in a in, in our executive MBA program at Stockholm School of Economics in Riga, we have, I think, more and more uh, students uh, that are executives, uh, you know, heads and or owners of the businesses that, that they do research, they write diploma projects on, on these issues. So they are concerned about, uh, about uh, what is going on with this digital and their business, regardless of which sector they are in. So, so, so they are at least thinking. Uh, when it comes to the, to the future, I mean, I would be very. I will not try to predict it because it's it's very it's very hard actually to do this. What I what I what I do see when it comes at least the the, the financial sector and and I think I, I think the banks uh, see it much better than than, than all of us, is that uh, well there are more and more players coming in, who do what banks were doing or could do. And 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 these are sectors that are not yet regulated. They they overtake many, many potential businesses of from from the from the banks and from the financial sector. So I think those banks that will not catch up with this uh, with this trend will simply disappear. And and uh, what what is bank today and what will bank be tomorrow will probably be different things. Same as uh, what what was bank ten years ago and what it is now. Would you agree to that? <laughs> Where the future it's, 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 us, it's, yeah. it's very hard to disagree. So, <laughs> but um, I think that um, what is uh, really important um, to, to, to mention here is also like uh, when when we as a bank we, we we should have some clear strategy or vision, and the management should have this vision how this future should look like, right? So. Uh, just uh, just to give an example, uh, again during the weekend while I'm walking the dog, I'm listening to podcasts, uh, similar like Christophs do. And I don't know the reason why he is walking <laughs> and listening podcasts, 
But um, one of the uh, one of the thoughts which was uh, said, and it was really interesting, and this was research done uh, in U.S. for like um, four thousand banks, and um, there was like question asked: What are the top things the banks are planning to develop uh, during uh, 2020, 2021? And number one was digital onboarding. Number two was peer-to-peer -peer payments. And again, I was going uh, and listening and I thought, hey, that's of course nice, but this is something we did already a few years ago because we saw that this trend is coming. And this is exactly uh, but, but you said, that if you are kind of predicting and you are seeing what the customers would like to do and what are going to be those key trends, if you are at the same level as maybe this fintech, you are not in danger. But this is exactly the, this, this management issue. The management should be kind of thinking that, okay, the business is changing, the customers are changing, we need to have and we need to embrace this change inside the organization. And if we remain like Kodak did in, in their view, then certainly we will be losing the business and other companies uh, will, will just go much faster because customers will decide whose services they are going to use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ju just to add about this disruption of the banking business, uh, again, it's, uh, so I don't know how we landed there about this <laughs> US and a uh, big tech. Uh, so it's, it's uh, definitely for those who has this cheap capital and a lot of cheap capital, right? It's, it's easy for them to enter these uh, new business, right? So Amazon is doing a land, land, uh, landing, uh, not lo loan, issuing loans, right? So there is a lot of rumors once uh, Amazon will start to be a bank for the, at least for the retail customers. Um, so the same is about near here, right? So the Gazprom bank, that's also, we know where it started, right? It's not the banking business in core, uh, but again, it's about the cheap capital. Uh, uh, again, on the same uh, different podcast was interesting uh, statement said about the people who actually are fans of uh, Tesla. And uh, you have heard the recent valuations on the stock uh, rise by 20% or? But percentage. Okay. Yeah. Percentage. Yeah. So, and the fact actually was that this valuation wasn't anyhow kind of logically reflected to, to the business itself. So there is actually a more uh, emotional valuation rather than the classical rational valuation, right? And uh, by using that, that, that opportunity, it's, there is again, uh, maybe a very good segment whom to target, I don't know, Tesla coin, which they would prefer to use because this is a kind of, uh, uh, like previously some times ago, Apple was a kind of, uh, statement, right, so you, you somehow differentiate, right, so uh, therefore I, I believe these disruptors can, uh, one is a cheap capital, availability of cheap capital, that's definitely the quick entry point for those big tech companies, but not just the tech, right, so Facebook, uh, of course they can also say that they are tech, right, so Amazon, uh, yeah, so we need to look look broader, not just in the industry segments. Yeah. yeah, I believe that they're using economy of scale. Definitely, they have like developed such technologies. And and uh, respect to that, I wanted to ask that based maybe you have seen some examples on financial industries like uh, worldwide in general. So, if we take a look from company side, so it, does it feel that more like digitization is more used in order to get efficiency on the work with the cost side, so kind of work with some legacy systems and so we have to change, or it's more used in order to get better service or like new revenue streams uh, in general, so comparing do those two types, so some I, I would say actually both, definitely both, yeah, because I sh showed this uh, S-curve graph, right, so if you want to, not to maybe a hockey stick, <laughs> but at least a positive growth, so you need to think about the new revenue streams. So it's it's not just uh, about the optimization, it's more about the incremental or disruptive new businesses. But of course, by using this uh, digital uh, enablement, you can optimize a lot of the, I don't know whether it's a, uh, some legacy of the how the processes have done. So there is a lot of new process mining uh, startups and scale-ups who actually provide very good services. So you quickly 
can do the audit of the processes, and there is a lot actually of money you can save on that, right? So mm -hmm. I would say both. Mm -hmm. I totally agree, and um, just to add, uh, I think that uh, nowadays, if we are looking at the economics, uh, there is very clear cooperation visible between the corporate world and also the uh, startup world. Because as we saw, the t technology is rising up so rapidly and so quickly mm -hmm. that you cannot really develop all the knowledge or skills in some particular verticals. And you need to be really open in cooperation with somebody who has this knowledge or who has the uh, know-how how to do certain things. And if you are open to these uh, companies, to these new ideas, you can together create uh, new models and replace some of the existing uh, systems which maybe are currently not that cost efficient anymore. Mm -hmm. So is it happening already? Yes. You see it, the, like for Certainly. example. So, yeah, yeah. so it's not like that. Only like cost part and like reducing some heavy tech machines yeah, to I some degree. Uh, yeah. I mean, this uh, again coming back to the mindset. Classical is approach is yes. Let's just squeeze more. Uh, just let's let's do savings. If the mindset is in place, then there is also about uh, thinking about the growth, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can bootstrap, but up up to the point, right? Anything to build up from that tangle? Okay, then let's let's jump to another like question, which where I think academic sector can like uh, dominate. dominate <laughs> let's say so. That what actually are the challenges uh, that the business schools have in this like digital revolution and transformation like uh, development? So what what do they have like as a challenge? As like everything is like digitized, I don't know, maybe some. Obstacles. To <laughs> well, um, yeah, th this is this is a good one. Uh, I think that. Well, uh, first of all, I mean, of course, we, the business schools, we we educate students, right? And th that is that is why we are for, and we should be able to do that. Otherwise, students will probably not come to us. But, but I think we should also, especially with this digitalization, we should kind of also sort of understand the customers, the students, a bit more, especially w w when it comes to how, how the students, uh, I mean, depending again on the, on the program, we, we should probably distinguish between the bachelor level, master's level, then, uh, then, then probably the PhD students, so, so the, especially these days, because these are different generations we are talking about, but still, uh, looking on how my kids uh, use uh, mobile phones and other other tools, and looking on how students used to perceive information and and, and gather information and and and, uh, and 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 receive information like five years ago and and, and today, uh, this this has changed uh, dramatically, uh, of course. And uh, and I rather doubt that uh, that lecturing. As as it used to be, as it is still, uh, will survive uh, for for next uh, I don't know ten or fifteen years. I mean, and just imagine the, the the lecturing started as as we all know because there was uh, one or two books somewhere in probably Cambridge or Harvard or Yale or or I mean hopefully Riga. I mean who knows? And and then uh, somebody could access the book and then uh, those guys, uh, usually men, uh, they could read it and they could pass the information to others. And 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 things has changed. But lecturing still remains in, in this type of, of form, even though uh, in reality, uh, lecturing as it is, I think it has uh, two features for, for two sides. One is for the lecturer himself or herself and feeling good uh, in front of the audience, you know, being able to, to do lecturing. And, and, and the second is, is to being able to entertain the students uh, to because the students could, could probably easily learn the same thing, mm -hmm. what is delivered in the lecture, in, in other way. And, and Siri or somebody else could, could also make uh, all those explanations mm -hmm. to them. Like, if they cannot solve mathematical equation, then, then they could ask uh, frequently asked type of question and Siri will, will answer instead of lecture. So probably lectures uh, or, or, or people in the, in, in the business schools will be more and I don't know, in five, 10, or seven, or, or, or 15, or 20 years, or maybe never, 
but 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 uh, if if this digitization if this digitalization will continue uh, as it is now they will probably be more like motivators like a moderators like uh, you know like a mentors assistants uh, when it comes to to gathering and in, in and and most probably in terms of not just uh, having the chips in the head kind of in terms of information but but uh, abilities how this information can be can be used in order to make uh, much kind of more more sense so it's it's from it's from um, really from from giving to to ap applying kind of things because i've i mean we, we've seen many 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 smart people many smart students coming out from the top business schools but not always they actually succeed uh, in in their lives and and quite often they do not because they do not know how to apply this so regardless of what we teach in 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 the marketing or or or, or strategy or uh, you know whatever classes uh, they go out and they do business as if they don't have this knowledge you know like like you know, this approach <laughs> as, as we call it right and then so i think that that is that is the that is the shift uh, uh what 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 we should probably consider but i mean i i wonder what students would say about this so you mentioned this like empathizing our students would be like one thing in order look, to change this thing so do you have any quick fixes or like ideas in mind so how that could be like uh, done if you would love to like change and transform as well like well in in a, the, the fix the, the the quick fix for for today would be involving audience more into the discussion for instance because mm -hmm. having the the time spans like like we do these days would be probably hard to listen and most of the people as i say well some are that wing is of course very polite wing and and they would they would listen and or or they will not even uh, have their laptops uh, in front of them but others would would behave differently. I mean, you know, look, look in the audience. Not, not now. Like ten seconds before <laughs> I said it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Ilya, <laughs> Ilya, maybe this. Uh, we got uh, challenges. Yeah. Yeah, yes, true. So there is both uh, front end and back end, so to say. In terms of the front end, I agree that uh, lecturing uh, has to be entertaining and emotionally appealing. Otherwise, there is no point for students to come and be physically present. Um, so probably some adjustments are into this process, but this, is, this was already covered by Arnis very well. Now I'll talk more about the back end. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the value chain, uh, which looks to me as follows, that uh, we see uh, some disruptive innovation somewhere, which is happening, in mm -hmm. fact. Now some time passes, let's say a year or so, and this is being studied by some researcher. Mm -hmm. Then research results are presented at some conference, then a, a scientific article is prepared, it's published and it's available. So basically this will take years. Now if you ask me a question what we can do in order to facilitate this uh, innovation culture, then obviously uh, we need to have a much closer cooperation between uh, um, higher education institutions and the business and somehow shorten this uh, uh, cycle of uh, studying or researching these uh, particular innovations which already occurred and bringing these uh, uh, experiences and uh, uh, examples into the learning process. Because otherwise, if we stick purely to the tr traditional process, that it will really take years. And then this innovation might have been outdated already. Mm -hmm. That's the main challenge. Do you also see it from like a uh, uh, business side, so and on the edu is there any lack of knowledge when people are coming and joining like a company with the digi digital skills, uh, how easy or hard is like to l give those things? Is it even like possible to learn and teach those things Not prior to coming company? I think that uh, the, the, the whole my speech was about the customer experience. <laughs> And this is clearly something, and I'm actually glad to see that in many high schools and universities, this becomes one of the key topics uh, for uh, students to cover. Because uh, if I'm just leading uh, this innovation group in, in Citadel, uh, believe me, there is a lot of other departments who totally don't know anything about the processes I was describing, and we need their involvement in this uh, way how we do the innovations as well. So we are talking uh, with uh, our um, legal department, uh, we are talking with marketing department. So basically I think that 
everyone nowadays should know at least something about this design thinking, about the way how you can create the innovative products and what this UX stands for. Because if you have explained and you understand that you can get out a lot of uh, cost savings or and in even mitigate a lot of different risks that you are not developing the product which just few people decided to build but you are like relying on the customer data you are in totally different league and 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 this is something where we see this need and we still do a lot of teaching ourselves but this is also something where we as a team inside the Citadel are really open for also like uh, universities and high schools here in the region to come and also share our experience, share our thoughts, how these things could be done and just get more people on, on this level of thinking because this would really help us to create a smarter country and this we advanced where is this definition mm -hmm. where we are heading because we need to just look not for small incremental improvements but we really need those hockey sticks we need some disruptive ideas we need some something where nobody has applied some of the techniques and technologies uh, before and this would really help us to be more successful not just as uh, individuals or the companies but uh, as country as such mm -hmm. <coughs> Again, coming back to uh, America first. <laughs> uh, I, I mentioned healthcare is one of the most disruptive industries, but uh, I think also in top three is education, definitely, right? And about whole uh, business models and how it happens. And I think a very good benchmark to look uh, is, for example, LinkedIn Learning. I don't know, uh, are you familiar? Uh, so the basically how what are the top courses on it's basically by the crowd source right so people are voting so it's defined by the crowd what are the top uh, lectures what are the top topics what are the top uh, industries to be digged in and their statement is you learn what you can apply already today so what, what you mentioned right that not you are studying for four years and then someday probably you will apply that right you need to learn something it should be kind of uh, as iterative as possible, so you learn what you can apply already today or tomorrow. And uh, uh, I, I'm really, uh, I don't know how to help actually, <laughs> this, but definitely as an employer, uh, we're looking for, for more kind of dynamic uh, educational system. I know that you are locked into this governance model for the four years rolling models or how many years? I don't know. This you need to define for at least four years, right? I, I don't think we are locked in anything. I mean, like a a, a, a yeah. curse, yeah. a curse. Yeah. So it's it's not uh, it's not uh, real time defined, right? It's really like if you are locked in a four years, uh, it's even not a sprint. It's I don't know, like a super sprints or I don't know how you call, can call like uh, in, in Agile, yeah. But it's too long, right? It should be more dynamic, it should be more responsive to, uh, to the end value, right? So what the business need or what the person would like to learn and become at the end, right? It's not to you, it's I mean to the whole uh, system that it should radically be changed and be more flexible, more adaptive, right? I think that's the I see as the most biggest challenge. And technology would be just an enabler, right? So uh, how you can uh, do that, so whether it's just uh, by the brain readers track the progress or whatever, it's, <laughs> it's <laughs> aside, right? But um, technology will enable that, but again, the core is actually about this governance, uh, about the consensus between the, all the parties. Mm -hmm. In interesting thought. So uh, I'm also thinking about these new technologies. So which is the moment when you have to like give this knowledge to the students? Is it like uh, when it's just appearing 
then is the moment when like educational side, like academia should give this knowledge to the to these like uh, students, or it's the moment when this, he's coming already to the company, and company is the one who is like trying to understand how this technology looks. So, any thoughts on that? So, I, I like this proposition for uh, academic uh, lecturers to be as a mentors. So, also changing a bit this role play. Why not actually ask students to become these early researchers so they come up with uh, what's hot? Right? Mm -hmm. You maybe can do this reverse mentoring as well. Yeah, that's it, it, yeah. yeah that's I mean, maybe uh, agreeing to, to everything that, that colleagues just said, uh, one thing, and that's why I started with, this, with these layers of, of education, the bachelor's level, master's level, and PhD. Uh, I think we, we, <coughs> should, we should distinguish here between fundamental and applied, yeah. right? And I, I love I, I love these conversations when, uh, when uh, usually company managers or entrepreneurs and always those with university degrees <laughs> argue that uh, education is, is good for nothing if it's not applied, right? Mm -hmm. but, they are, but they are those that, that has been going through this education, right? And, and usually in those discussions, we won't see anybody who is without the university level education. And, and wh what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that similarly, like in, in the research, there is, a, there is some fundamental thing which, will, which is seemingly not applied. It's, li it's like basement for the house. You cannot live there, but you cannot build a house without it, right? Sure. And, and, and in, a, in, a, in a business, you know, we, 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 we use mathematics in order to, to to up the upgrade our our logical. brains and logical thinking and and you know so and so on so on goes, on on a, on a master's level executive master's courses of course as as a lecturer you will be thrown out of the of the audience very quickly if you start uh, digging too much in the fundamentals those people really they need to grab the knowledge and go out and 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 use whatever type of knowledge you you are you are you are you are giving same also about this um, uh, the, the the question that relates to to uh, to application of, of this mm -hmm. of this new knowledge. So so of and course there is something that is fundamental, something that is technology, something that is that is being developed, and, and then there is something that, that can be and by someone being 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 applied. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think here is, is, is also important discussion when it comes to how this new knowledge is generated before it is applied. And and uh, and for the business schools if I if I may say uh, this digitalization is a, is a good uh, is is a very good phenomena that is happening because uh, business schools can do research, whatever type of research in the digitalization or in in, in whatever type of, of of area more efficiently. I mean, these days you don't have to go to to US, regardless of how you how much you like the country. <laughs> Um, you can you can stay easily in uh, in any place in Latvia with the internet and do your PhD studies. Mm -hmm. Of course, I mean ev even better if you have somebody who mentors you, who who motivates you, somebody you could talk to. If you can go to the conference and add these three three things, as 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 uh, as, as Recep Rector said in the in, in her keynote speech. Of course, we we are still humans. We need some interaction, but. But I, I did I did my PhD studies more more or less from the distance uh, some time ago already, and I, I'm, I'm I work with uh, with people from Australia, US, uh, Western Europe, from from rig office or from my home, uh, where I kind of also like it to do a lot. So 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 I think this is also a good good way of uh, how, how how digitalization actually is helping the, the the business schools, and and even if even if we are not anymore the lecturers as in a way that we are still smart mentors would also be more preferred by students than than not that smart and and this this is involvement in science is something that that generates smartness in, in one way or another if it of if it is of course linked with the industry and the policy making so on and so forth yeah mm -hmm. Oh, uh, yes, generally agree. Uh, I think it's also very important, or this is a kind of a task of a professor of, or of, uh, an academic staff member uh, to clearly show a link between mm -hmm. something which is fundamental and the same piece of stuff which is applied. Otherwise, of course, there will be mismatch of those two. Of course, it, it, it gets trickier, especially with mathematics and things like that, and, and especially when it comes to financial formulas, where one Excel formula can, can replace whatever 
pages of uh, you know calculations in a normal uh, yeah, textbook but this is again this is a task of an academic staff how to present these things so that this is uh, very well taken by uh, students mm -hmm. thank you wanted to build up something okay then uh, i will say big thanks to all the gentlemen about being here in the room and discussing about the digitalization in general so and i hope that the audience as well uh, are much greener <laughs> today and much uh, digitized today so um, and i think it, it sounds like that that the change is happening still that uh, we can if we will not change ourselves then probably somebody else will come and just like take our place uh, right and but we also have to understand how to work with like that in the long term so timely like to involve um, in some actions where we can understand so okay wh which is the direction where i have to change right thank you everyone for joining and you will get the certification as well uh,